The voice is audible for me. Yeah, thank you. So, shall we start the talk? Before starting, can I have an introduction part? Uh, yes, madam, as per your wish. Okay, start. okay. Thank you. So, it is uh, uh, the webinar that we are going conducted, national webinar that is Recent Trends in Drug Discovery, a Role of Spectroscopy and Computational Tools. But this, today is the second day of the webinar. Yesterday, there was a beautiful talk given by the two eminent professors. Professor Prasad V. Bharatam, he is a senior most professor in Naipur Mohali. He explained about the computational tools and what are the advantages of the computational tools and the procedures for the various computational tools. And the second speaker is a scientist from IICT, Indian Institute of Technology, TSIR, Hyderabad. He is Akela V. Sharma. He explained about the principles and applications of NMR spectroscopy. The two speakers have given an excellent like, talk on the two advanced topics, which, which was being useful for both B form as well as for M form students, as well as for the research scholars. And today's talk is will be given by the two eminent speakers. Among the two eminent speakers, the first speaker is Professor Katiravan. He is a professor in SRM University, Chennai. And uh, the second speaker is uh, Guru Padaya. He is also a professor in pharmaceutical chemistry. Uh, JSS Mysore and the first speaker, the topic of the first speaker is a uh, drug design and medicinal chemist approaches. This is also an advanced topic and a very good topic. Please listen to it. It will be useful for all branches of uh, pharmacy and pharm students. And before uh, giving his talk, let me introduce uh, Professor Kativaran by uh, his curriculum vitae. He did his, he is at present, he is a professor and head of the Department of Pharmaceutical Science Chemistry, SRM College of Pharmacy, Chennai. And before that, he worked in Seven Hills College of Pharmacy, Tirupati as a professor. And he, he was a postdoctoral fellow in Uzbekistan, Darwan. And he was an associate professor in Singar College of Pharmacy, Pune, and assistant professor in Essence College of Pharmacy, Pune. He was a research scientist in Jubilee Chemist, Noida. And before that, he worked as a Shingar College of Pharmacy as a lecturer. He did his PhD from Bharti Vidya University, Pune College of Pharmacy, Pune, Maharashtra. And uh, he did his MPharm from Samaj College of Pharmacy, Nasik, Maharashtra, and BPharm from Tamil Nadu NGR Medical University, Chennai. And he's experienced, he's expected ex expertise in designing of novel biomaterials for drug delivery applications. Experience in optimizing reaction using transition elements like uh, palladium, copper, platinum, silver, and a catalyst. And ability to work independently and ability to interact with multidisciplinary team, team of biologists, pharmacologists, and other collaborations. Experience in working with uh, microwave assisted organic synthesis using focused microwave systems. Good understanding and expertise in QSAR technologies, 3D QSAR, TCSAR, V Life Sciences, MDS, hands on experience and training on Schrodinger, that is, docking studies. Her own knowledge and experience of scientific database searching and good oral and communication skills and presentation skills also. And his achievements are he was an author for Corpus in Index Journals. And he received a postdoctoral fellowship from Darban, South Africa, Uzbekistan. And he was a senior research fellow from ICMR, New Delhi, and project fellow under University Grant Commission, New Delhi, and junior research fellow, AICTE, New Delhi. And coming to the grants and awards, uh, uh, he received an excellent initiative program from SRM University of 4.4 lakh class and received a grant of 10 lakhs under the first track for young scientists for DST Delhi in 2014, and received grants for 2.3 lakhs as co-PI for the University of Pune 2012, and won Research Day 2009 gold medal held at Saram IST, Katalakula, Chennai on 28th February 2019, for the best article entitled QSAR Molecular Docking and in silico ADMET Studies, one best poster award from the Honorable Chancellor of SRM University a research articles and edited 3D QSR molecular docking and molecular dynamic simulations of 4 amino phenolone derivatives as DNA gyrase beta inhibitors 
and he won first prize for the oral presentations uh, in the Amidcon Institute of Management, Baliwal, Pune, and IGPER Award in 2008, Best Research Project for the year 2005, and Best Poster Presentation Award uh, in the 57th Indian Pharmaceutical Congress, 2005, Hyderabad, and Best Poster Presentation Award in 54th Indian Pharmaceutical Congress, 2002, Pune. And he had about 55 publications and 50 poster presentations. And he had invited talks in national level conference, guided around 25 students as master level and two PhD students completed. He is a brand ambassador for Bentham Science Publishers 2018-19. And he was a co-editor for Journal of Natural Remedies. And this is about a brief uh, TV about Kathiravan and today now he is going to give a talk. He's, now he is going to give a talk on drug design and medicinal chemist approaches. Uh, thank you Kathiravan for uh, immediately accepting our invitation for giving a talk on the advanced topic that is drug design and medicinal chemist approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you madam. It was indeed a detailed uh, description rather than a short theory. So much. Um, Boss, is there? Hello? Am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, you are audible, but little pause is there. Okay, yeah, things yeah. are actually slow. We are adjusting, no problem. You can continue. Okay. Uh, is my screen visible now? speaker Madam, is my screen visible? Hello? Your screen, we can able to visible, but it is not 100%. Uh, uh, what do you say? Huh? Full screen, we can able to, able to see. Full slide. Looks like dark like that. Now is it okay, madam? Ah, uh, now it is nice. Perfect. Okay. Okay. It's fine. Thank you, madam. Um, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, for your kind introduction and uh, thanks for the invitation. So, uh, good morning to all uh, dignitaries, to the students, UG, PG, PhD scholars, faculty members, wherever you are. Uh, I will be talking today on uh, drug design uh, aspects, like uh, a medicinal chemistry perspective. Right? What does a medicinal chemist think about when an individual looks into a structure? So this will be like uh, taking to a basics, like because the audience may be like undergraduate or post graduation or, or as well as the PhD scholars. So we'll start in initially with a medicinal chemistry perspective. What are the various approaches generally we uh, do in the designing of new molecules from the textbook uh, definition to the recent advancement, what is going on in the current scenario. I will emphasize more on to the metabolism guided drug design and scaffold hopping, which are very important, you know, like uh, which many of the students or even the research scholars are not aware. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Crystal, is it okay to say voice? Okay, but your slide is uh, not full slide. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the contents uh, which uh, I'll be today discussing is nothing but your drug design and uh, the roots. What are the roots of drug design? What are the challenges we generally face in drug, okay. dis drug discovery and the medicine chemistry approaches in drug discovery and the type of. No, sir. Excuse me, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hello. Sir, your slide is not uh, displayed uh, fully. Okay. Can you please maximize that? Yeah, I maximize here only. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay, now? Yeah, yeah okay, sir. No. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. So, anything, please interrupt and tell me if the slide is not. Sir, normal. again, it was minimized. Sir, hello? Yes. Again, it was minimized, sir. I don't know what is the problem. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Presentation mode, can you please? Yes, put it into this presentation. Is it fine now? No, sir. Can you please keep it in presentation mode? Ah, okay, sir. Now it is fine, sir. Just a minute, give me a time. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir, sir keep it in presentation mode, sir. Yeah, yeah, it's a switching, madam. Looks okay. okay. Is it okay now? No, sir. It is not in presentation mode, sir. It is in full screen only, madam, for me. is full for me. The presentation mode only from Is it visible? Yes, sir. Okay, sir, you can continue, sir. Thank you. To start with, everyone is familiar by the three weeks uh, in drug, like drug design, drug discovery, and uh, drug development, which shows you know like key uh, role in the invention of any new drugs. So, drug design generally we talk about identification of any new novel scaffold from the scratch, like the novo design or from the existing molecules. So, designing part is that uh, in designing it is mainly considered in those days only the biological aspects. The uh, how it interacts with the receptor or protein. And drug discovery is nothing but you, you start from a, a, an array of chemical library of thousands and millions of molecules. From there, you identify some lead, and then you try to identify the lead and optimize it, the lead molecule, and then you move to the next level. The drug development, you know, like uh, more into the uh, pharmacokinetic parameters, like and the ADME parameters. So initially, like uh, three to four decades, it was only the biological activity that was so important than any other parameter. So people used to do a lot of chemical synthesis. Because obviously you get a lot of uh, heat molecules, lead molecules, and then uh, the molecule used to fail at the later stage, like ADME. So uh, once there was evolution, like uh, the Lipinski rule, then people started considering all these physiochemical properties, especially the the ADME toxicological uh, parameters, how it contributes. So that was also considered in current scenario at a very preliminary level. So when we talk about design in current scenario, we not only design new molecules, we look, lot, we put a lot of filters to cover the ADME toxicological properties. So the rules, you know, like why drug discovery is so complicated with so many, uh, you know, like with a lot of uh, uh, Various disciplines like 40 to 50 department disciplines are involved, and huge amount of money is poured. But still, it is always a challenge problem because there is uh, no guarantee that even after investing such huge amount of money, one can come out with a drug molecule. So, it involves various disciplines, interdisciplinary approaches from pharmacology, medicine, chemistry, organic chemistry, biochemistry, analytical chemistry, dynamics.
kinetics, kinetics, even including the IGR properties. So as a scenario, as everyone is aware, uh, this uh, particular process, like wet right discovery process, takes around minimum of uh, 12 to 14 years of uh, drug discovery, uh, markedly available drug. So to identify this, uh, initially there will be a basic research uh, where we try to identify a target molecule, a disease condition, okay? In those days, I'm talking, this is a little bit like an old scenario, how did the drug discovery process was like 20, 30 years, three decades back. So they need a problem like a target protein or disease conditions, then um, they try to do some sort of validation. And then here, the medicinal chemist or an organic chemist used to work where they uh, try to produce a library of compounds, then use uh, HPS screening, identify some few candidates. Once the candidates are identified, they move to preclinical development, you know, like the other properties are considered, um, animal studies, and then they file with the INDA, and then go with the clinical development process and file the NDA, and then the FDA approval file process. So it's a very lengthy process, a lot of cost is involved, and there is no, as I told you, there's no guarantee like after 15 years, if I invest this in some amount of money, this money. Uh, you know, like a high intellectual scientist, uh, there is no guarantee at this end point. So this is how the modern discovery uh, uh, process works, which is a cyclic process. You go through a 360 degree rotation in all process. So with the advancement of uh, uh, computational chemistry and the synthetic biology and the advancement in the proteomics and genomics, we can identify the target protein receptor at gene level. So now what is required is we have to work on these gene level to identify whether this uh, target, the receptor, the enzymes or uh, anything whichever we have identified is a valid target or not. Because there are a couple of cases like in uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis when we were working on isocitrate line. Okay, that was one of the key enzymes where we were working on 2003 or 4 then it was uh, identified that isocitrate layer is not a valid. Similarly, another example like COX, COX-1, COX-2, COX-2 selective inhibitions which resulted in many of the cardiovascular uh, problems. So now the primary objective is though you identify a key biochemical process, target or protein, you need to have validated. Validate in the sense that it does not, when any uh, inhibitor binds to that, it does not inhibit any other day-to-day uh, uh, -day biochemical processes or pathways. So once you do that target validation, yeah, when you, once you block that particular pathway, that enzymes or in that uh, disease condition, you are able to achieve some good biological response, then we try to screen hundreds of molecules right, from the chemical library, either we use the online tool or uh, uh, readily available library data pages of it. Then you use hundreds of molecules, then there's a uh, lead, once you identify lead, you try to profile it and you try to optimize the lead molecule. So once you optimize, you go to the preclinical process and then you come to the clinical process and any problem from here again, it's a cyclic process, it's a, a reverse translation process. So the modern drug discovery process is a cyclic one where everything is interlinked. You've got the target selection, heat discovery, candidate identification, clinical trials, and then it goes back to the uh, target selection. Again. This is a regular process what is being done. Now the challenge is what happens is we have readily available, you know, like 10 to the more than 10 to the power of 20 direct like molecules, uh, chemical uh, databases available. Similarly, on the right hand side, you can find like the biological space where you can the protein structure, uh, like 10 to the power of 4 to 5. Okay. So all these molecules are either commercially available or freely available databases. Are there. But you know, like these proteins, though we have 10 to the power of 4 or 5 human proteins, uh, how many proteins are, you know, like uh, targetable for any disease condition and uh, they need to be validated. And the protein structure need to be determined either by using X-ray or NMR crystallography. So there is always a gap between the biological space and the chemical space. So this needs to be bridged. That's why we work on the drug discovery process because it is very less the exploration of the protein structures available in human body is very less, but we have a larger number of ones. And then you cannot screen all these millions of compounds randomly across all proteins. So this gap between the available compounds and the validated target from the protein perspective has to be bridged. 
So the problem arises now how to choose what is the goal of a drug design. It is nothing but to identify a lead compound that optimized to give a drug-like candidates. Right? Um, you, you have a group of molecules, you identify your lead, and that has to be you know, like optimized and then moves into a drug-like candidate. So to optimize what you do is we can do a lot of chemical synthesis, chemical modifications, either you want to alter the physiochemical properties, reduce the toxicity properties, we can do that, but with the retention of the biological activity which we can have. The challenges, as I told you, you have millions of compounds and STS, high throughput screening does not allow more than a compound and this particular screening like STS is not possible for all type of uh, testing, you know, like all, all type of targets cannot be uh, suitable for HDS. And a smaller proportion of compounds are available. And when you talk about uh, screening millions of compounds, yeah, that is always uh, that process. The large scale screening is always an expensive process. So, uh, in drug discovery process, there is always a challenge, and there is a lot of other factors apart from, uh, you know, like uh, identifying a lead molecule with a good therapeutic activity. So today to address, I'll start with the various medicine chemistry approaches, which uh, we use regularly the textbook definitions and uh, some of the key factors which we'll be focusing on in the uh, metabolism guided drug design and scaffold hopping. So these two are very good techniques. Uh, so I'll emphasize more on these two topics today. So the first one uh, is the combinatorial chemistry. So combinatorial chemistry, like uh, as I always say, like it was three to four decades old chemistry where uh, in those days it was from the chemistry section we were moving to the biology aspect. People used to do a lot of chemical synthesis by combinatory chemistry, produce hundreds and thousands of chemical library molecules. So randomly those molecules would be tested on n number of enzymes without any proper logic. So what it does is, where, as I told you in combinatory chemistry, when you have three fragments like three substrate A1, A2, A3 and B1, B2, B3, I can produce like at least six different types of compounds. So randomly what is done in drug discovery process by like all these nine different compounds. So the, the possibility of finding a heat or lead molecule from this process will be very, very, very less. So the success rate will be less. However, you can construct a lot of uh, screening compounds from a basic uh, building block materials. So this is nothing but an array of chemically diverse compounds uh, through systematic, repetitive and covalent bonding linkage. And this is, uh, we don't use now this era where we move from chemistry to biology, but now what we do is we identify and validate the biological protein, the target protein, from there identifying the enzyme site, active site, we go back to the synthetic molecule. So it's a reverse of what we did around the three to four decades like back in the community symptoms. The next one is the regular isosteric replacement. As the name indicates, uh, isosteric replacement generally discusses about, you know, like uh, uh, when you have a molecule, we try to replace the molecular shape or size, uh, try to reproduce its own valency electrons, electronic shape. As I always mention that a molecule and receptor, when they are interacting, it will be like a magnet and ion. As we recognize the molecule is having carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, etc., the body, the receptor does not recognize. The receptor will feel only the positive or negative ionization potential or surface electrostatic force of attraction. That's all it requires. So you can imagine like it will be a magnet and an ion which it attracts each other. So when you are able to reproduce the similar outer valence is an electron in a property by substituting with some other atoms or groups, then we call that as an isosteric replacement. So that they have similar physical and chemical property. But once you replace those atoms or groups, and then when they are able to give a similar biological response, then you can call them as the biosteres. Okay. So isosteric replacement is nothing but atoms or groups or exchange of uh, atoms. Once you screen, once you get a good biological response, uh, equivalent to your parent molecule, you call that as the bioisosteres. So the bioisosteres main objective is to produce similar biological properties relevant to the parent molecules. So in this, we do not touch the basic scaffold. However, you can classify the isosteric repla replacement in the textbook like mono, di, equivalent, and then cyclic, cyclic. Uh, Cyclic equivalent, there are a lot of uh, uh, aspects which can be covered. So, 
So one such example is like, you know, like aminopyrin, you know, like isosteric replacements where this was uh, converted into a, a carbon uh, center where the carcinogenic effect was reduced in this aminopyrin. So next, third one is the de novo design. Uh, de novo design is nothing but these designs where we start from the scratch, from zero level. Okay? It creates novel chemical entities only on the information regarding a biological term. So in de novo, there are two approaches. Uh, generally, we can consider like ligand-based and structure-based design. We can uh, even put it to uh, as a subsection of these to be in our design. So when you don't know anything, when you suppose when you know about the protein, suppose we have a protein structure, we try to find the binding site, active site, and then uh, you, you have it's a simple like lock and key mechanism. So once you have a, per, a perspective idea on the binding site, then we try to construct molecules over the grids and then fit them to find a lock uh, to a respective key mechanisms. So in this you can again divide into ligand-based drug design, structure-based structure drug design as the name indicates. These are familiar technologies, so I am not talking more onto that ligand means once you know the, uh, the scaffold is good, but the protein structure is not determined. Now that the other side when the protein structure is done, we call that as a structure-based drug design. Okay, when, whenever there is no protein structure determination, we do with the homology type of model. Okay. And the other one which is a good and general approach is the molecular hybridization approach. Where uh, we call this as a synergistic approach because we know like this uh, pharmacophore is active, this pharmacophore is active. So we try to form a hybridization, we try to bridge this one based upon the condition that this particular pharmacophore has the key interactions required uh, for to elicit a biological response. You cannot randomly pick any two models and hybrid and get it. So each uh, before even uh, doing a molecular hybridization approach, you need to have an understanding of for a, this is an oxidizable molecule. So you need to have what is the core structural features. So which particular fragment in this particular is a, is a, a binding with the amino acids and similarly for the triazole type of molecule. Then you can combine these two, provided, see, it's like a synergistic activity only, you know, like 1 plus 1 is, go, is, a, is equal to 2. There's no much uh, difficulty. But the only problem is if you try to mask some key functional group, which are responsible, which are uh, free in this particular scaffold type, if you are masked by hybridization, that, then we will lose a biological activity. So to do this also, one as a medicine chemistry has to sit, analyze, you know, like what are the key fragments which contributes, which particular atom contributes for the biological activity, which particular fragments in a given structure is responsible for the physical chemical properties, all those has to be identified and then you can apply this molecular hybrid approach which can improve the affinity as well as efficacy when compared to the parent molecules. So uh, this will be a win-win situation. So this is one of the safest methods where uh, medicine chemistry can, you know, like uh, uh, use this approach. You can take two different scaffold, go through the literature, and then from there you can easily design some hybridization approach onto this. Yeah, the next one which I'll be talking more is the scaffold hopping techniques. So this is one of the uh, modern medicine chemistry uh, requirement uh, has resulted in uh, successful modules. So what it does is in, in scaffold hopping uh, when you compare with an isosteric replacement is. When you talk about isosteres or bioisosteres, you have the basic uh, fragment present. The basic component is going to be the same. You try to change some small, small fractions in and around. But by doing a scaffold hopping, you take one scaffold. By doing a type of scaffold hopping, it can be a primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary scaffold hopping, you can convert one scaffold into a completely different scaffold, yet their binding affinity is staying towards a given receptor. So you try to identify this is scaffold one, I can convert this into it. This is oxidizer, I can completely convert it to some other nucleus like thalazine, which will have similar binding affinity towards a common response. So there are various aspects how we undergo a scaffold hopping. So this particular topic I'll uh, discuss in detail with some uh, classical examples and case studies. So uh, once I uh, review all these 10 types of, uh, 10 or 13 types of drug design, I will be talking in detail about the scaffold hopping. So this is a regular approaches uh, which are being used from 
ancient times, like uh, from the direct discovery process, like 40 to 50 years, which we call it as an analog design. So you have a basic scaffold, a simple example like carbamate, and uh, you have a cyclic amide, okay, that has been replaced by an amino or cycloprotein structure. There are small changes. It's a product, it's an analog of this. So this becomes an analog of it. So this is very safe game, you know, you always have uh, the biological activity is same, so you don't have to worry much. So that so a small changes at this position can make can increase or decrease the biological rate. So the success rate will also be you know like good. It will not go down once you go with the analogous type of design. I'm not going to read all the given definition. These are classical examples. You know like analogs. All belongs to the same analogs. Like triazo, you can see like ribavirin. The amide is converted into an imide type. And uh, the other approach is like a pro drug approach. So it depends on what is your target. You know, sometimes we need uh, some drugs which has to pass through the uh, oral or the GAT tract. Because we have a lot of enzymes present here, which can convert a drug molecule into an inactive form, or it can convert a drug molecule into a toxic substance. So to bypass those enzymatic, you uh, make a pro-drug approach, you can pass through the cascade of enzymes and again you need a specific enzyme which can break down or convert a pro-drug into a drug molecule. So all these are very familiar and regularly used approach in medicine chemistry, analogs and pro-drug design. More or less uh, it will be related to each other. Yeah. Another important aspect where uh, even people students always think about is they want to find out a drug molecule, drug meaning, it always starts with enzyme. There are millions of compounds which have been identified in HCS screening, which has got good biological activity, but they have failed in ADMB properties. So you can start designing molecules, even when the molecules have failed at the metabolism or in any pharmacogenic parameters or if it is uh, producing a toxic metabolite. So metabolism studies uh, will always uh, uh, be done to identify what are the soft spots that are susceptible in a given drug molecule so that it gives metabolic instability. So suppose you have a drug molecule, the body is having hundreds and thousands of enzymes, uh, you have the phase one, phase two, oh, you know, like a biotransformation. So phase one, what, whenever a drug is taken by a human body, what the microbes thinks consider them as an external molecule, they don't want it basically to survive in the body. So it will try to add some lipophilic, uh, if the molecule is lipophilic, it will try to do some hydroxylation and amino introduction, or it will try to club with some glucosamide concentration. So basically the enzymes, the, uh, especially the cytochrome 4 p 50 what they do is they want to convert a non-polar molecule by introducing a small host group, alcoholic amino group, or a conjugate with some glucosamide and make the complex polar. Once the complex is made polar, they can be easily eliminated from the body. Okay. So here, there is always a scope for students to take some molecules which are, you know, like metabolically instable or if the enzyme is producing any toxic metabolite. So there also, so we can use a lot of drug design aspects. So generally, in, uh, when we talk about biotransformation, what the body does is anything, any xenobiotic, usually it will be a lipophilic molecules, Okay, because that favors absorption. Once it comes into the body, the microbes will try to convert the lipophilic into a hydrophilic fragment and then it will try to throw it off from the body. And this is an evolutionary process, you know, like we can't do anything with this. So even if you find a new molecule for this, over a period of years, the microbes are going to evolve. So they are going to find out some other way by which they can try to throw the molecule. So it, it, it is not a permanent solution, it's a transformation process. And sometimes, you know, like uh, the biotransformation can lead to a toxic metabolite and uh, that can cause, uh, you know, like teratogenicity or other toxic substances. So when we, so when, whenever you design some molecules, you need to have, uh, you, you have to understand what is your target, what is your appropriate pathway, and what happens to the molecule when you subject it to human body. You have hundreds of enzymes. Then it, then it is, you know, because I talk about cytochrome P450 because 95% of the drugs, you know, go through that phase. 
So in when you when uh, the drug molecule is affected by the cytochrome P450, there are a couple of shortcuts or ways by which we try to manipulate, increase, or um, uh, increase the metabolic activity by doing a lot of uh, small small techniques. Mm -hmm. So one such technique is reducing the lipophilicity. Okay, we need to have a lipophilicity of the molecule so that it gets absorbed, but the microbes try to convert them into hydrophilic and then uh, throw it away from the body. Okay, and then we can manipulate like the steric as well as the electronic factors, and sometimes we can work on stereochemistry. If it is a R configuration where an enzyme can do a, uh, an aromatic para hydroxylation, then you can convert that into the S isomer. So it all depends once you read, once you get a good biological response once you go for the metabolic study suppose if there is a problem try to identify a problem what is the problem where it is doing uh, the hydroxylation where it is making the compound highly toxic or making it more highly unstable or making it more polar you will have to try to identify those parts whether it is a lipophilic or because sometimes we try to look for very soft spots present in the molecules so that i can do their own chemical reaction. So if enzymes can do a lot of organic uh, biochemical transformation, then what we do in the laboratory. Okay. The examples what I quoted here, you know, like I will discuss it in coming slides, like introduction of a methyl group, fluorine, and then the uh, metabolic stable structures. So one of the tactics to modulate the metabolism in cytochrome P450 enzymes. I'm talking about a single P enzyme for you. You can try to lower the lipophilicity of the molecules. Okay. You have to identify it. So when you lower the lipophilicity of a molecule, we ensure that we do not disturb the fragment which is responsible for biological activity. The other way is modify the site of metabolism. Okay. If, if, if this is your aromatic ring structure, if the enzyme is doing hydroxylation, you can block that site. You can uh, occupy the para position with some other atoms or smaller groups. So that it is not uh, available for the enzyme to do some metabolic part. Then incorporation of fluorine to make the molecule more polarizable. And the reason one is like uh, incorporation of deuterium, an isotope exchange with the hydrogen. So these are four tactics generally which you can use when the drug molecule fails at the metabolism by the cytochrome P450 enzymes. Either you reduce the lipophilicity, modify the site, incorporation of fluorine and the incorporation of the deuterium. So you see, there are some couple of examples which I took from the uh, readily available papers, you know, like uh, uh, which can give you some idea about how these factors influence the uh, D-half as well as the C-max clearance. If you look into this molecule, you don't worry about what is this, it's a sulfonamide type of uh, substitutions, don't worry about the activity also. It, it is like a gamma set trace uh, enzyme inhibitor assay. So if you look at this proper structure, it's a, a cyclic process. So by converting this, this is a lipophilic in nature, by introduction of a simple hydro atom here, okay, this is a hydrophilic, I mean like lipophilic, this is made, made like hydrophilic by introducing of an oxygen atom. But see the difference in the clearance and the log D distribution, it's a 5.6 and 3.1. However, there's a change in the IC50 Value, of course, when you change a small atom in a potent molecule, there will be a definitely uh, a change in the biological response. So, so these factors can be considered, you know, like considering converting a lipophilic into a hydrophilic parameter. So here you can look, it's a tetrahydrofuran, then you have converted that into oxygen, a former four carbon spacer and an oxygen, here it has been reduced to three carbon spacer. So the lipophilicity is reduced. So in this case, you can see, sorry, in this case, you can see like the log D value, see the IG50 values you can retain. So it's like learn and it is almost close to that. You will not, don't expect an exact value when you make a small change in the hydrogen atom. See the, uh, you know, like uh, clearance rate 70 and 29 milliliter per kilometer per case. So this has increased. So half life can be increased by changing that. So it spends more time in the human body. Now these are again other examples. You can see that comparative statements are given, like see how the log D is affected. So this is an aromatic structure. Okay. 
So three membered an oxyl is introduced and a hydroxyl group is introduced. See the difference in the small introduction of a O and a hydrogen group. See the pH six seventy six and it goes beyond three point five. But you know, like the volatile activity, as I say that it will be you have to play in and around this. If there is a much deviation when the value moves from uh, nano to micromolar, then do not touch that substitution. So maybe we can play and uh, play. This region, unless until it doesn't have any significant contribution in the biological activity, because even the small uh, parameters, uh, the hanging groups of anchoring on the outside of the scaffold, can make a big conformation change in the structure, which can either enhance the activity or decrease some of the activity. So th these are also again uh, metabolic examples. You know, like it's a pyridine type, we introduce a morpholine and sulfonide and a carboxylic acid. Uh, made the compound lipophilic into a hydrophilic structure. So you make this molecules. Uh, this is again one more example of a known drug in Dinamil. You know, like these two are the possible metabolic sites where the enzymes break cut down or uh, did some sort of hydroxylation at this position, and then it was removed in the body. So this is active methylene group. So this was protected by using a dietary type of substitution, and similarly onto this side. This particular structures we have been replaced with uh, an introduction of a polar nature substance. So this has altered the physiochemical properties, and then it will either increase your T uh, half or uh, cleave, and obviously there will be a small difference in the biological. So again, these are a couple of examples where you can make small changes and big difference. You know, like you see all these three examples, the I C F T values kept same. By the retention, because you you touch only this particular fragment, you see you can see it. Tile a tiny tile, I mean a mini tile, I mean. But see the log the value from two to three point four. So these all small manipulation, even students can take up molecules which are spelled in the ADM properties and start designing. Because you have lot of readily available, you know, like online softwares which can give all possible uh, metabolites coming out uh, once you subject it to zero to fifty structure. And one more structure is uh, one more aspect is the introduction of a chlorine molecule. So you can find lot of drugs containing chlorine molecule, fluorine molecule. Sorry. So the fluorine is generally incorporated to increase the metabolic stability or to enhance the polarizability of a given molecule. So in this, you know, like uh, there was a hydroxylation at this position, so to block that metabolic uh, site where it is not susceptible to cytochrome P450, a fluorine group was introduced. So See the difference in the nanomolar concentration. Even we got a better activity. But see the difference in the uh, clearance and the log D value distributions. Almost the same. The same thing. Stereo isomers. So apart from biological activity, try to take a molecule. Try to identify why does it fail in either it fails in absorption or distribution or in metabolic pathways or it is producing a toxic metabolite. If it is producing a toxic metabolite, identify the soft spot. Identify the enzyme. What it does to the soft spots in the given enzyme, given a, a molecular structure. So you block that structure, so it is not really available. So thereby we can, uh, you know, increase the biological half life of these molecules. And the last part, which I try to emphasize out of these four, you know, like in metabolism drug design, is either we try to reduce lipophilicity, modify incorporation of fluorine, and then incorporation of butyrate molecules. We know that uh, deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen. Okay, so uh, what uh, what generally deuterium chemistry does is when you have uh, carbon and hydrogen. Okay, uh, you have carbon and hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen we try to replace with deuterium. So the enzyme when they are uh, uh, open to C by P enzyme, the enzyme can recognize or break the carbon hydrogen bond quite easily when compared with the carbon deuterium. So the time taken for the enzyme to understand, to react, and to break the carbon-deuterium bond is more. So the drug concentration can be reduced, the half-life can be increased for these type of drug molecules. However, this is uh, one of the recent techniques, but the problem with this technique is also the stability of our molecules. Because deuterium, as you know, like we'll be using in chloral enamor, like D2O extinct series, CFD, or D6. The problem with that is it is highly unstable. CLP will be getting converted into CHCl. The same problem is with the deuterium chemistry. 
you know, like we were FDA recently uh, approved a deuteral benzene, one of the deuterated drugs, first deuterated drug which is available in the market. So this is one good, uh, you know, like uh, pathway by which we can inhibit the metabolic instability. Even we have worked on uh, the drug molecule like um, metendazole, you know, like it's a very uh, long old drug, first line therapy. Uh, you know, like for the treatments, but it produces one of the toxic metabolites, what we call it as an acetamide, because they are susceptible to oxidation, then glucomide conjugation, and hydroxylation. So, what we try to do is uh, uh, we have an intake group. So, this was a position where the enzyme was doing the hydroxylation. So, the CS3 was contained to CS2 watch. So, to block this, what we try to do is we try to convert the CS3 into CD. We exchanged all the three protons with the deuterium. However, the, we are at a very initial level of identity. We are able to get the similar biological activity, but how the metabolic pathway is going on is still uh, we are under the investigation. So even when you replace the CH into CD, the enzyme uh, finds it difficult to recognize to break this bond, and that is enough for us to uh, reduce the drug concentration. And even this deuterium concept can help us in addressing a lot of uh, um, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, because, you know, when you have a drug molecule, you have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, causing the micro uh, microbes present in the human body is also evolving. So, they know whatever atom, whatever atom present in the accordingly they are going to do their biochemical transformation and throw it away from the body. Now, when you put some new atom, new like an isotope B, which the microbes are not available. So it is going to confuse the microbes, it is going to take some more time in their evolution process, and the bond also, carbon deuterium bond, is tough to break when compared with carbon hydrogen bond. So that is how we have to optimize and play. But as I told you, the biggest drawback with deuterium chemistry is it is highly unstable. The drug may anytime, you know, like reverse back to the original proton bond. Uh, am I audible? Hello? Okay, I hope it is audible. Uh, next one, please. Next one, uh, we move on to the virus oriented synthesis. I'll have a couple of and then we move on to the scaffold hobby. So biology oriented. So biology oriented. So biology oriented synthesis is an efficient uh, way to identify uh, a small structurally diverse molecule from a uh, natural product synthesis. So this we can generally correlate with the uh, you know like a natural product where you take your enzyme, break them into scaffold and different methodologies. And like retrosynthesis we can do. So once you do a manipulation, we try to have a lot of variety of substitution and then you go back to the synthesis so you can produce a lot of, uh, you know, substituted yogimine as a simple starting material. So basically we look for, you know, like diversity which can result in the diverse biological activity also. And this we can, the starting point for this would be generally the uh, natural product synthesis. Uh, diversity oriented synthesis is also an efficient manner you know, like uh, to generate uh, diverse scaffolds. And generally the idea behind this will be the generation of a complex structure. So for example, if you look into all the presented structure like Jephthalib or uh, Levofloxacin or uh, uh, Pruluidine anywhere, I can find a common fragment like a morpholine is present into this uh, structure. So now I try to identify morpholine as a basic scaffold. I try to uh, find a uh, lot of uh, substitution in an around molecule to build a complex molecule with wide range of substitution on all positions. For example, if you look down, so from here I identify like diversity. Here we need it, it's from the uh, uh, chemical synthesis to the biological aspect from the old uh, scenario method. So you look into the morpholine structure here. So we try to construct a lot of um, substitution in an around morpholine. Here we try to form a bridge one, sorry, we try to form a spiroketo or we try to form a ring animation type of uh, stretches. Like, you know, once we identify a morpholine, we try to do a cyclization followed by a number of reactions where we use 
and uh, amino aldehyde combined it can be combined with an one two diol where you get uh, these type of examples or uh, diene methoxy acetaldehyde with uh, an amino acid uh, structures or you can use an amino dimethyl acetal with an cyclic acid also if you look we got a totally you know like diverse compound having centralized morpholine as the basic scaffold we can do a uh, spiral keto bridging ring annihilation so you try to take a basic scaffold try to produce hundreds and numbers of molecules so which is related to that so then you do for a chemical testing of those molecules so in this approach you can use like uh, uh, two types even like a uh, ligand or uh, reagent base and then the scaffold base so if you look into this particular uh, uh, image on the right hand side we have common common starting material you try to have one common Suppose let us consider like a ketone or any structure. We try to react it with a different type of amine, amino acids, amino aldehydes, or amino acids. So you have a common starting material, vary with n type of reagent, and you have different molecular skeletons. So the starting material is common. On the other side, what you do is you try to have similar conditions, a common conditions for all this, and then you have a starting material which has been pre-encoded. The sigma is nothing but you add some fractions or uh, substituents present onto the basic scaffold. This is your basic scaffold. This is nothing but a variety of substitution. The encoded starting material which can be ready. So you have this common factor. You change this, or you have this as a common factor. You try to change this. See the diversity. You will have distinct molecular skeleton in this approach as well as in this approach. So the purpose of this, as the title indicates, is it is going to be diversity oriented synthesis. And then you can do the um, uh, screening of those uh, valid molecules. The next one is uh, diverted total synthesis. Again, uh, uh, this is of again a natural product synthesis analog, which will be useful for uh, a natural product chemistry taking uh, as a starting material. So I'll not talk much on this because yeah. uh, then comes your uh, in silico approaches where you talk about ligand and structure based drug design. Okay, and uh, uh, as we know that ligand base, where you know the uh, basic uh, uh, structural information, like structure base, like design, you know the structure of a protein. Okay, this you can use like a QSCR, machine learning, everything based on this, and this you can use like uh, molecular docking. The structure is not available, you do homology modeling. So uh, I, I will not talk much on this because uh, I have uh, to speak more on the scaffold hopping type of techniques. So for ligand-based uh, techniques, you can use uh, in recent days. It was initially the Corwin and where we started with the QSR model, then it went to 3D QSR, then it went to RD Kramer, then 4D, 5D. Till date, we are working on 6 to 7D QSR. And now the the paradigm has completely shifted from QSR into machine learning approaches. What I do is generally break down the molecules in all possible fragments, try to get some matrix type of information, and then. Uh, they try to correlate those basic fragmented information uh, with the readily available database. So when the fragment is present, it is uh, believed that the newly identified scaffold can give a similar biological response. Uh, this is structure-based drug design. Once you know like um, the biological target is there, then uh, you have to uh, design and prepare the molecules. You have to identify this is a pathway how you do a molecular docking process. Uh, Select then the binding identification, docking scores, so one to the experimental part. So I'm not going because nowadays everyone is aware of uh, the molecular docking structure based drug design and lighting based drug design. Yeah, artificial intelligence, I'll come back to this once I uh, finish up with the um, capital hobby. Yeah, this is one of the recently, you know, like familiar methods where. Uh, uh, you can find a different scaffold uh, from a good potentially in molecules. So what we do in these type of similarity searches, uh, when you have an active molecule, okay, you try to find out the fingerprint of those molecules. What are the key fragments? You can put it in terms of numbers and box, whatever it is. This is your active molecule, which is giving biological response. You find out some fragments. Okay, uh, these fragments you can search in the readily available database. Okay. Or Get the fingerprint of this particular structure. You find out some similar structure of, uh, you know, like uh, this. You can you can find that you have like amino, a pyrimidine, and amide sort of structures. You use this as a key uh, starting point for the similarity search in the database. You get 
uh, you know, like am I linkage everything. Now try to find the fingerprint uh, yeah, mapping of this scaffold. You find that, you know, like you can look into that, you have uh, the dark shades are six, which will be, you know, like at least matching with three. This is matching with this scaffold. This is how you do like the um, similarity search in the Many times, you know, like there are a lot of search engines which are uh, commercially available, but still there are a lot of really available database. Once you get a lead molecule, even if you don't know anything, try to fix a fragment, do a fingerprint analysis, search it in the, the commercially or uh, freely available database. You can get a, a similar scaffold or some fragments matching with that, and that you can take it as a lead starting material. And now we come to the uh, interesting topic of scaffold hopping. Now this is, uh, scaffold hopping is a method of drug design where we try to alter, uh, replace the central core atom uh, of a known bioactive compounds, but this can lead to a similar structure or completely structure opposite to that of the starting material with the retention of biological activity. The scaffold hopping concept uh, generally analyzes and compares core structures of active compounds within the analogous series. Okay, so like uh, either series and scaffold hopping, there is a big difference. Okay, the biotic activity will be we will try to retain, but we can end up with a new scaffold starting from uh, which can give a completely different structure from the origin structure. So what is the need? Why we go for a scaffold hopping type of reactions? So we are, it is always believed that when you change the scaffold, there can be an increase in the binding affinity, increase in the uh, physiochemical properties, increase in the biological response directly. So changing the scaffold can also lead into drug-like properties. So when you do a scaffold hopping, we look for two key points, whether to enhance the biological activity and or to enhance the drug likeliness properties to remove it. Obviously, when you change a small atom, when there is a new status, when there is a small change in the physiochemical properties, obviously there is a big change in the biological response. So the scaffold hopping can be classified into four different types. One we call as a primary, secondary, and tertiary, and quaternary scaffold hopping. So primary scaffold hopping, or uh, we call as a heterocyclic replacement. As the name indicates, I'll be discussing in detail uh, in subsequent slides with few examples. So scaffold opening, uh, next one is a ring opening, where you can open up some ring, close down the ring, you can do a lot of chemical manipulation. Third one is the peptidomimetics, where we try to, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, reproduce the peptide, because we know like peptide drugs are highly, metabolically, highly unstable. So we'll try to retain that particular conformers uh, when you have a peptide leakage, and then you try to produce non-peptide structures to increase the metabolic stability. And the fourth one is the shape topology based scaffolding where we can come out with completely, as I told you, new scaffold with retention of the biological activity. So the scaffold hopping is generally classified, depends upon the degree of change associated, how much degree we change from the basic scaffold, how much variation we bring down into that. So the primary scaffolding, as I told you, is a small minor replacement, like uh, swapping a carbon atom a uh, hydro atom replacing in a backbone. So it's a minor modification. We want to have a hydro atom with the retention of a backbone. Like a, a few examples, like you replace carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur in a hydro cycles. You know, like you can uh, find uh, some few examples, uh, like uh, anti obesity. So you look into this molecule. Uh, this is a um, pyrazole type of molecules uh, by doing a scaffold hopping. You know, like everything. Everything is retained, you know, like this, all the three substitutions, not this. But the core might be the basic scaffold, pyrosol, a pyrosol, or a pyridazine. This is a So this drug molecule phase a proper parameters, then AstraZeneca and the Sonophyte Aventis work on this type of molecules where they retain. This can be a classical example of the primary scaffold model. So you retain all this, make a small change, a replace a carbon with a nitrogen, a nitrogen with a carbon, there we call, we classify them as the scaffold. Okay, so we believe that they do not contribute much in their biological response. Okay, see the basic scaffold, 
uh, the rheumatoid was having this and he ended up with a six member with the dihydrogen so you can alter this and check various physiological properties so one more example classical example for primary scaffold how can you use the coxid hmm? hello no sir no sir yeah i think there is some distance. okay so the other one is uh, like the cox inhibitor yeah, so uh, no. the benzene sulfonyl and cyphoxetures where you have a thiophene so you can return both the buyer and type of compounds and their own uh, specific oh. rotational transformer and then move it to internally pyrazo or an uh, type of compounds so this is a good uh, strategy where you can retain the biological activity and improve the ATM type of compounds a property the primary scaffold hopping uh, the secondary type of uh, scaffold hopping is where you try to if there is a okay. structure you try to open up or if there is a open structure which can first the tv lo ostunda why we do is flexibility on the open structure or closed the flexibility of molecule play is very important role so that is to be the optical bond Okay, and which results in the member penetration and absorption of the molecules. So this also plays very important role when you do a secondary type of uh, scaffold hop. See, this is a typical example. In the, on the right hand side, it's an open structure where you have an uh, alkoxy and an amino substitute at the ortho positions, which are O alkoxy, and then the NH substitutions. So that can be easily, you know, like uh, secondary type of scaffold hopping, what we call that. See everything. Rest all is defined the same. The chloro, the thiazole, and the carboxy moiety is retained for the biological response. So you can do a small manipulation. Of course, you know, you know, like uh, here the molecule is going to be polar. Here the molecule is not polar. If suppose if this is giving biological response, or if this molecule is staying in the ADM, you can break down this molecule and get back to the uh, alkoxy and the uh, secondary amine type of structures. So ring opening and ring closing can be done in case of the uh, secondary uh, scaffold hopping type of structure. So these are again a few examples where you have a thalazine. Here the biological activity it is retained. So we try to break down this molecule into uh, you know uh, an amide type and anthranilic amide. It's an anthranilic acid derivative. So amide substitution is done, and then you can do a chemical manipulations at this position where you change the a uh, substituted amine at this point so you can uh, make the ring open or close these are few examples later on you can do so in uh, secondary scaffold hopping what we try to do is you try to construct the ring or try to break the ring which do not involve biological response which contributes basically for the ADME properties that we have to identify once you do the uh, liver metabolic uh, studies and the uh, experiments So you cannot directly take any molecules and do a scaffold hopping. You need to have a thorough understanding of each and every atom and fragment present in the molecule before going into the uh, designing of the molecule using scaffold hopping. So a lot of uh, uh, NNRK non-nucleotide transcriptase inhibitors in HIV are outputs of uh, even QSIA and uh, scaffold hopping. The tertiary uh, scaffold hopping is nothing but the way we try to replace the peptide backbone with non-peptides. As I told you, the peptide will always have problems because of its stability issues. So it is usually good method. The tertiary um, scaffold hopping is good method to produce a non-peptide moiety. So what uh, they try to do is once you have a peptide bond, suppose you have Uh, you have something like CO and NS2 at this position, and then you have substitution at above as well as below. So that peptide moiety, the peptide linkage conformer will be kept the same, and then the molecules will be constructed on the on both the sides. So it becomes like which gives better stability, and the conformation vector for the biological activity will be retained because that we capture the molecule in the active peptide conformations. Okay. And that this why we need these type of drugs is because a lot of uh, endogenous substances and hormones present in the body when they uh, when there is an imbalance in the body that leads to a lot of disease conditions. So to overcome that endogenous peptide, we try to produce some compound similar to that, which is non-peptide in nature. 
Yeah, a simple example like uh, uh, one example where we try to do convert this into a peptide form is a uh, an epidermal growth factor receptor uh, type of anti-cancer drug in CF uh, for amino quinazolines. And uh, see, as I told you, the fluorine and fluorine. The fluorine plays very important role because this was introduced in the polarizability of a molecule. So anywhere in any drug molecule, whenever a fluorine atom is there, just check whether the fluorine is present for biological response. But in many of the cases, the fluorine atom is introduced to give metabolic stability or block the metabolic soft spots that are uh, susceptible to enzymes. So even in this also, uh, in jefitinib, uh, you can find, of course, in jefitinib, this was introduced to increase the solubility issues, but this was involved in the biological interactions. So now, uh, you know, like this amino can be enhanced and converted into a peptide form. Uh, the biological results showed as potential equivalent to this jefitinib type of analogs. So what I did is, you know, like you have a uh, three carbon spacer and then the amino links and then you have the morpholine and amino types, but here we are trying to introduce a peptide type of linkage. And the fourth one is uh, habitual screening, which is uh, completely, you know, like uh, uh, a scaffold technique, but uh, many of the students, what they use nowadays is virtual screening, they climb it, but basically the underlying principle behind it is a uh, uh, quaternary type of scaffold hopping. So the completely, this is what I was talking about, you can come out with completely new backbone, only retaining the required biological response. So we have a lot of softwares for this uh, type of scaffold hopping ready level. I'll discuss that in coming slides. So uh, these are few examples in the replaced, like you have two amino pyrimidine, which has moved into, you know, like pyrosol type of structures. Yeah. So this is how uh, you identify a molecule like uh, Lapatini. This is one of the right molecules. Okay. So we try to find, when you try to write about the scaffold hopping, we try to find some common, maximum common substructures, what you call this. So, which and all is matching with already uh, reported molecules. So, if you look into these two molecules, these are the only common features present in both the scaffolds. So, these are not common because this is an aromatic and this is an heterocyclical. So, this maximum common structure can be further broken down into molecular framework. Okay, this molecular framework is the basic scaffold over which the substitution can be added. So, if you look into this, this particular fragment is a molecular fragment where you don't consider any of the substitutions. And then all the double bond and the carbon-carbon double bond will be removed producing the heterolytic basic scaffold and then you break all the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen or oxygen heterocycle, we come back to the basic graph frame, framework type of molecules. So from here we will try to find out the fingerprint regions or we will try to uh, you know find a lot of descriptors. Uh, matrices, values based on that, and then we try to find uh, similar values from the readily available database. So how do we, how we do this uh, maximum common substructure analysis or scaffold 3 is, we have a set of rules by which you have to uh, break down the molecules. Like you have studied like more about the syntone approach where you break down the final molecule into a small linear size. Similarly, in scaffold tree, you can, there are certain set of rules which uh, you can use to break down the molecules uh, to construct the scaffold tree, what we call it as a maximum common structure. So when you have common structures, what, uh, which should be given preference, you have a set of rules like uh, uh, you remove three member heterocycles first, then uh, uh, when you have more than uh, uh, like 11 member ring, 10 or 11 member ring, do not touch that. Remove rings first by the longest, which have got the longest uh, acyclic linker chain. And uh, when you have a uh, spiral keto linear true fuse, you try to retain the, uh, the spiral keto type of conformation, and then you can alter the fuse to bridge the ring system. And when you have bridged and spiral keto, you give preference to the bridge system, try to break down the spiral ring, and you can easily remove ring 3, 5, and 6, which can be uh, you know manipulated at the last level. And uh, removal of these, these are set of rules which is uh, you can uh, uh, get through these uh, set of rules in the um, I met a lot of uh, review papers, even I took it from the review papers in JMATEN. So, I have written set of rules 
like a, there are rules for simple approach similarly you need to read this approaches so when you do a scaffold tree analysis maximum substructures and then you break down and then you go back from the basics to the uh, uh, reverse you can completely get a different scaffold so these are the levels how you break down we uh, looking into this uh, examples these rules and regulations you can break down so it's like a simple approach you know like you break down this molecules into basic fragments okay so now what you can do is you can find this as a fragment if you do uh, the uh, you have some finger print region so that finger print region you can uh, match with any of the database you get uh, you know some scaffold which can have nitrogen in the the aromatic ring structure and a few other structure but that can be completely different uh, uh, heterocycle and then you can bridge it uh, go back to the starting with the retention of a biological activity it's um, uh, you know like uh, some things when you are aware of the um, um, simple approach break down molecules but you need to know this rules which to break when to apply primary scaffold or thing when to apply secondary tertiary or a quaternary type of scaffold hopping. Yeah, these are some of the you know like uh, examples in the library given library how do you select how molecules uh, are biased suppose you consider like uh, 100 molecules are present in this particular library and each represent 10 by looking into the structure you know like i can say that all 10 molecules are assembling there uh, belonging to the same scaffold we always try to find diverse scaffold you know like if, if you see here like if this is a hundred molecules database, ninety molecules of uh, if it is considered if it is given in this ring, all ninety molecules are belonging to the same scaffold. So it's better to have a scaffold completely different. We need not to have a cluster of molecules in like this curve. Yeah, it was good. The cluster of molecules, the homologous series, the continuous series was good when you do a few set type of design. Now when you use like a lot of other techniques like machine learning, deep learning, the uh, machines, the algorithm records a diverse of scaffold. Otherwise, it will become like cluster. So it was good when we used in ligand based drug design. We need to have cluster. It has to be within the scaffold. But now the era has changed. We need to have a diverse of scaffold. Then we can put and pull a lot of small fragments and uh, identify what are the key requirements for the biological response. So this is how uh, the catch is. So there are a lot of software, you know, like uh, cats, keywords. Uh, you know, like series two inside, they even give some basic uh, fragments like fingerprints. So suppose if you look into this molecule, this is a basic uh, carbon graph framework, okay? So this is how the, the system recognizes the molecule. It doesn't care what type of nucleus, it is an aromatic amine or fluid. So once uh, the system, the structure is spread into the system, it is only carbon hydrogen, it doesn't bother. So from there, it will try to note down what, what uh, or the aromatic center. So you like you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, six aromatic centers, six aromatic centers are there. Then six aromatic, six aromatic centers are there. This is nothing but an acceptor, hydrogen bond acceptor. So you can consider this as a different point. And this is a hydrogen bond donor. And the rest all of these substances are lipophilic in So that's why it is lipophilic. So this is how the molecular framework is constructed. Then there will be given a combination of uh, like a donor plus uh, uh, aromatic donor plus lipophilic structures and then you can add up and pull these values from their molecular descriptor scaling scaling region so that fingerprint region we try to map with some other database and then we can get back to the original model so this is just one uh, method by which uh, descriptor scaling is then using CAD software so this is how uh, this is uh, you know like a SEINS uh, descriptors what it is and how it is broken down into the reduced ring system. So this is what they need. So they can replace this particular ring with some other structure matching with it and then construct back to the original model. So once you do that, this particular scaffold will be completely changed, giving rise to a different scaffold. The other uh, software like say, keywords, as I told you, we can use uh, for the um, uh, coordinate type of scaffold hopping. What it does is it considers these two as a vector uh, representation. See, all these images I have taken from the reported like discovery today. What it does is if you look into this uh, structure, so you have R1 and R2 here. This is a query molecule. You try to identify a potential query molecules, okay, 
from there this favors will try to identify the vector direction like it recognizes r1 and r2 in two different directions r1 and r2 so from there it will try to identify the bond distance and bond angle okay that becomes the uh, vector definition so it will search the complete database related to r1 and r2 what is the bond angle and bond distance and then it will try to bring out the molecules which is matching with this particular fragment so there is always a high possibility that with this molecule when you define these two vector as proportional you can come out with completely a different molecules when you do a study set that is what i was talking about and cats you know you, you can like how do do they recognize this pharmacophore you, you know like all these factors are also available in many of the uh, 3d phase models of uh, qs are even installed in them because they have a the aromatic ring Uh, five basic descriptors they use: aromatic ring, hydrogen bond donor, etc., and cyclic structure. Similarly, with cats descriptors, from you want to uh, donate, uh, produce your molecule, they fragment into these five: uh, lipophilic or hydrogen bond donor, etc., then ionizable group because you have a carboxylic acid, so it becomes like a, a negatively ionizable because COO H is be converted into COO minus. And the NS2 can pick up any proton uh, from the body. It can be protonated easily, so this gets converted into a uh, positively ionizable group. So this is how it uh, determines and breaks down the molecule for the fingerprint analysis and similar features from the database. So these are again, as I told you, a similar example to the um, vector definition. You see, like compacting and heterostatic. When you see, you can say that some you know, of these two structures are. You know, like a completely different structure. See the example you see here: x1, x2, x3. So you see here: this is one, this is two, and this is three. All the three: one, two, three, and three times. See the carbon spacer between this and this. It is kept, but see the carbon is a carboxylic. It's a heterocyclic ring compound. So there are a lot of processes: how a topological uh, parameters or the distances, bond angle, bond distance, vectoral calculations are done, and uh, readily available softwares even there. So as I told you, in a lot of virtual screening, the background work will be similar to the scaffold hopping work is done. So this is one uh, simple example, like uh, used to say, like ivermectin another, which is a, a you know like anti-tumor activity. So using the uh, scaffold hopping or uh, other types like ring opening and altering natural product. The problem with natural product is only one uh, type of compound can be synthesized. But when you will try to break down the molecule, when you try to define synthetic groups, see how different uh, type of substitutions can be incorporated. All the red ones. So here also scaffold hopping was done, and that paper, you know, like uh, nature inspired, he got a diversity of highly potent molecules there. Right so we try to do either to increase the biological activity or uh, reduce the uh, toxicological properties. So I think uh, I come to the end of the talk. At most, it is 45 minutes. So the, what I try to conclude is there are a lot of sources uh, readily available for scaffold housing. Uh, even students use on the uh, terminology of virtual screen. Okay, so try to incorporate, try to understand the pharmacological properties. So increasing getting a potent molecule is not alone a drug design and medicine chemistry perspective. Even improving the absorption, metabolism, toxicology reduction, kinetics profile is also a medicine chemistry work. Everywhere we fail in the fail in the ADMB property. So getting a best lead molecule in vitro assay through H2S, HTS screening is always good. But in this aspect is always good. So anybody who is going to work, you can uh, look into those areas, look for the which are failed in those property. From there you can try to optimize and get. Uh, Uh, you know, like uh, uh, the molecule can be refined by scaffold hopping. So this will also have you know, scaffold hopping approaches to maximize the chemical diversity uh, while maintaining or improving the biological activity and the pharmacological profile of the original molecules. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll we have come to the end of uh, my little bit of brief introduction on various aspects of how we design. Uh, drug based upon the various uh, traditional method and the vision method. However, we do have machine learning, deep learning, uh, neural networks. Everything will be under you know like uh, uh, artificial and neural network type. So whenever we talk about artificial neural network, it does something similar to human body. 
uh, it tries to understand, it tries to practice itself, and then it tries to learn everywhere. You know, like like human body, it will try to learn, it will try to uh, give reason, it will try to self-correct itself. Okay, there are various subsections of uh, artificial neural nerve, which is again a detailed talk separately. But as of now, in artificial neural nerve, it is good in missionaries in a uh, lot of other disciplines for drug discovery, we are at a very primitive level where we try to use uh, uh, the machine learning approaches, uh, especially in the uh, identifying, uh, identifying a wide range of uh, clinical diverse scaffolds. So apart from that, uh, uh, it's, you know, like the application in drug discovery is at a very preliminary stage. So with this, uh, I will stop here. If any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I didn't even stop in between. I am not, you know, like clear whether I was completely audible uh, throughout the talk. Yeah, madam, I think uh, I finished on time so that uh, our next speaker, uh, Guru Padya sir, is there. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, sir. Good morning. Sorry, good morning, sir. Uh, Kadhiran, sir, can you please tell us the references, the book book of references? Uh, reference, madam, uh, better you can, you know, like scaffold up in every slide. I, I couldn't, uh, it is good, no? it is not audible properly. Is it not audible? Man, is it problem, ma? Is it clear now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I can, uh, sir, will you please? Madam, I can mail you a couple of papers in Jmail, please. Okay, okay. You mail to me uh, so that I can give it to my students. A textbook where it gets revised, you know, like after 10 years, second edition or third edition. I always suggest you yeah. go with uh, Jmail and, you know, like Nature Communication, where you get a lot of reviews. So that will give you okay. the information that the old traditional model. I will mail you That's the fine. Two references, four to five references. Uh, I think okay. that will help you, uh, help the students. Okay, the, you please send me through mail so that I can give it to my students. Because there is an audible problem in my auditorium, so my students couldn't able to hear your voice properly. There is a small disturbances in the middle, so they couldn't able to follow you properly. So we want some of the references of, of course, they can go through YouTube link, no okay. problem, but they, they want, on behalf of them, I'm asking you. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll mail you, madam, no problem. But you could have stopped. Thank you. I would have stopped. And then we yeah. have those problems. Okay, thank you. Any any questions or any doubts from the audience? Okay, sir. So you you have given a very good lecture on drug design, the medicinal chemistry approach with uh, uh, with some examples, and uh, maybe it is very much useful for the MPharm students. Uh, thank you very much for your elaborative and excellent lecture. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, madam. Thank you for the thank you. opportunity. You know, like uh, it will be always from the student point of view. Somebody will be coming and talking. Try to learn because what we talk is will not be available in the textbook. So yep. try to get some key points and use it somewhere throughout your curriculum. But even at the PG okay. or B level. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now the second speaker is uh, Professor Guru Padaygaru from JSS Mysore. I think so. He is online. Yeah, madam. Sir, good afternoon. Ah, uh, good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, it may be morning or afternoon. <laughs> so the second to speaker topic is on spectral analysis of organic compounds by mass spectroscopy. Uh, it, this is also a very useful talk for all the branches of from chemistry. And uh, before giving his talk, I would like to read out his biodata. Uh, professor uh, Guru Padaya, presently he is a professor, Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, JSS College of Pharmacy, Mysore. And uh, he finished his uh, diploma, as well as Bachelor of Pharmacy, Master of Pharmacy, and Doctor of Pharmacy in Bangalore, Gulbarga, as well as University of National College of Pharmacy, Shimoga. And he worked in different places as a lecturer, assistant professor, and professor. Uh, presently, he is a senior professor in JSS College of Mysore. 
and uh, uh, under him he around 45 mcom students have been guided and three are undergoing under him and three phd students have been awarded under him and seven are doing phd under him and number of publications are international it is 85 and national 119 and uh, he had uh, five projects which have been completed under him and one project is going on and apart from his uh, all the uh, important projects and all he had uh, an awards also some of the awards uh, like uh, tedi in annual award for the best research paper and the cipra innovative pharma research award for the best poster presentation and powerpoint presentation best oral presentation award which was been conducted by apticon in 2016 and uh, uh, received an honor of appreciation in 2018 by jssmi academy of higher education mysore and he had also won paper patented uh, it was been patented in the year 2020 apart from all these things he had a research projects already have mentioned around five research projects which are from iict ugc major research project bst and jss aher mysore so that's about a brief introduction about uh, professor gurupadaya now he is going to give a very good lecture on spectroscopy in the identification of organic compounds sir uh, will you please continue the talk sir yeah yeah madam definitely yeah, yeah. yeah your voice is so audible i in the ball or in ball am i audible madam yeah you are very clearly audible okay thank you thank you very much for coming thank you thank you thank you for giving an introduction about my uh, architecture which was hello madam yeah yeah you are fine we are fine we can able to hear your voice nicely okay okay the fine madam then okay uh, so, uh, yeah, i will share the slide madam the slide madam okay thank you invoice bond akka quality bond and voice bond topic bond quality bond voice sara bond madam slides are visible please confirm me hello 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 sir is it audible sir slides are slides slides are visible slides my slide is visible to you hello please can slides are also visible sir so you can continue okay thank you thank, thank you for confirmation fine thank you for confirmation because these are the two things i had to confirm before commencing any presentations and all whether i am audible whether my slides are visible if these two things are well then i can definitely proceed for presentation uh thank you very much for giving an opportunity to make a presentation in the andhra university that is the new college of pharmaceutical sciences andhra university and uh, so they are given me an uh, a topic which is uh, uh, mass spectroscopy of course uh, the entire you are given the uh, presentation yesterday since yesterday uh, these are the presentations are going on and different speakers are given the a uh, very advanced topic especially related with uh, the intelligence uh, which is an artificial intelligence which was uh, one of the important topic which was uh, currently it is going on and uh, so currently uh, today also there is a drug discovery related topics are also coming and uh, so today i am planning for the structural analysis of organic compounds by mass spectrometry okay so this is the topic which i am chosen and uh, so given by your uh, the team of uh, webinar team and all uh 
Uh, so uh, maybe here in this particular presentation, so I am planning to cover uh, the important concept, especially they are related with your mass, uh, mass spectrometry, and followed by the types of ions and fragmentation rules. Maybe I hope that there is an audience or uh, informal students, right, madam? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, fine. Because the, this particular presentation is going to be more helpful for the second year or maybe the first year of pharma students. And because uh, without uh, the mass spectrophotometry, there is no any uh, the interpretations for the, their organic compounds and all. I hope that this particular topic is going to become interesting for them. And uh, so it will be uh, applicable for their any interpretations which they are going to do it in their uh, research and all. So uh, the, in my presentation, I am planning for the, uh, what are the different types of ions are there in the mass and followed by uh, there are different type of rules are coming here, like uh, maybe the nitrogen rule or hydrogen rule or magnetic rearrangement and rule of 13. And I'm planning uh, the followed by along with this presentation, there is I am doing some of the uh, examples also, because the examples are most important in giving in most idea about how exactly the, the fragmentation which is going to occur in the case of your mass spectrometry. Okay. And these are the content I'm planning here. I'm hoping that, so I'm getting in the, the full one hour of time for my presentations. Okay. Hoping that you are going to give your complete attention for this presentation and hoping that you are going to take in the, whatever that I'm planning today and it is going to receive accordingly. If suppose any doubts are there, please clarify that doubts at the end and keep it accordingly in your maybe the voice flags or maybe accordingly so that we can discuss those things once the presentation is completed. Okay. Uh, so here I'm moving on to the mass spectrometry here. So this particular slide is going to give in the better idea about uh, the mass spectrometry. So I can consider that mass spectrometry is considered as one of the uh, simple balance. Okay. Simple and uh, very thin balance in the available in the universal and which is for the measurement of the important ions here. Maybe we are already aware about the different type of measurements are going to make it for the different uh, weights and all. Now what we are going to weigh here is in molecules only, like in atoms or uh, molecules we are going to weigh and we are going to give the information about the molecules and molecular weight here. And the majority of the case, what is going to happen here in the case of your uh, mass spectrometry, uh, we are going to pronounce it as a mass spectrophotometer. But usually uh, there is no any mass spectrophotometer here, there is a mass spectrometer is there. So. So I'm planning to give the more clarity about uh, uh, the mass spectrometer, not mass spectrometer, it is a mass spectrometer. So we are to, supposed to take it accordingly while you are, because the remaining all spectrophotometer you are all, all are aware, maybe the UV spectrophotometer or maybe IR spectrophotometer and colorimeter, where there is an involvement of radiations, absorption and emission and uh, so measurements is going to take place. But whereas here in this case, so there is, an, uh, in, there is no any uh, kind of an absorption and all is not going to happen. It is only the thing which is going to happen here in this, then only the destruction here is there. So hence, we should not supposed to call this um, uh, instrument as a mass spectrophotometer. So better ideal way, the ideal uh, that name would be a mass spectrometer only. So this way to supposed to take care in our future while we are uh, talking about the mass spectrometer. So not the mass spectrophotometer. And another technique, the technique which is coming out from here is a mass spectrometry. Okay, some of you are going to write is a mass spectroscopy and all. Maybe the mass spectroscopy is also not an ideal here. It is an the appropriate te technique here is a mass spectrometry. Okay, and the person who is an operating the mass, which I call it as a mass spectrometrist. Okay, this is how I am giving an, uh, the better idea about the mass spectra here. And so then here in the case of your mass, the usually the question is coming, what is the purpose of mass spectrometer? So it is main, uh, the basic function it is going to do here is then it is for the, the weight. So weight of the organic compounds, weight of the molecules, molecular weight you can able to find out here. And you can also find out the, what is the nature of that element. I think but whether uh, you can able to find out their different nature of the uh, molecules, they are, how they are uh, present in the molecules. Of course, there is an only the mass, it doesn't give any complete information about the structure of the compound, as you are aware that. So there is a need of N, uh, the NMR and mass, and followed by there is an uh, UV and IR. These are all the 
the different instruments are required in establishing the structure but now the mass is an important instrument where we can able to give the information regarding the mass of the that and we can able to establish the structure of the organic molecules based on the molecular weight and arrangement of the molecules and molecular formula can be done and where here the mass we can able to see the mass from this we can able to identify the unknown molecules and any unknown molecules are there whose molecular weight is not not known and we can definitely find out the molecular weight of the compound and once the molecular weight is known then later we can go in for the uh, the quantification also this is interesting one uh, so there are two things are there in case of your um, spectrophotometer is concerned your uv spectrophotometer or ir spectrophotometer especially uv is concerned uv spectrophotometer which is meant for the quantification of the organic compound by suitable by checking with a suitable wavelength and uh, lambda max of the compound but whereas here in this case so we can able to find out the information about the what is the name of the compound what is the structure of the compound what is the molecular weight of the compound and later we can do the quantification this is another interesting one so we can do not only uh, the identification we can also do the quantification and this quantification is more accurate compared to your other uh, techniques like it may be in hplc or maybe gc or maybe in other so i can consider that is a mass is an one of the best detector best detector in finding the molecular weight of the compound compared with your uh, lc with uv or hplc with uv or lc hplc with pda or maybe there is a different variety of the instruments are available where we can able to do the uh, the quantification of the compound the most accurate mass is possible by using the uh, the mass here okay so i can consider that the mass is the one of the best technique where we can able to find out the Uh, information relatively within uh, any unknown things are there you can able to find it unknown things means take it granted here the question is coming what is the molecular weight of the compound let you take a molecular weight of any uh, so maybe from the 100 to 1000 or lakhs uh, daltons so we can able to find out the molecular weight by using the mass here because there are wide variety of uh, mass is available maybe in hrms is there and simple mass is there simple mass what is the difference is there between the simple mass and uh, hrms that is uh, only the simple difference here is then where, where we can able to get a more accurate mass is possible by using a higher resolution mass only that is the reason that is called as a mass and difference where we are going to uh, discuss when we are going to see the in the remaining uh, presentations and all and uh, now i move on to the what is the versatile uh, applications of this so using this mass what we can able to find out we can able to find out the information relatively with your molecular weight and results are very accurate and the sensitive results are possible and accurate results are possible by either you can connect with the hplc of course the you, when you take any hplc currently whichever the instruments uh, you are observing about the ms is concerned so there is a front end will be in either hplc will be there or all maybe the gc will be there and uh, when you are connecting the hplc or gc with an ms so your instrument is going to give a lot of information regarding the the once it is get compound is get separated either by using gc or by using hplc either you can connect this mass to gc then we can call it as a gcms and when you are going to connect it as an hplc and this is called as an lcms only and uh, so where not only the hplc and gc sir sorry for the interruption sir hello madam any sir uh, the slides sir the slides are not is moving okay. yes sir the the slide is uh, not moving sir slides are not moving yes sir okay one second Yes, sir. Now it is over. No, no, because this is not the presentation mode, and this is actually the presentation mode. Whether this presentation mode is visible now? Okay. Next, this is this is visible now. Right, visible. Yeah, this next uh, background with the basic instruments of which HPLC is uh, LCMS is visible now. Hello. So I am showing the LCMS instrument that is visible now. hello sir now i am seeing the lcms instrument this this slide is changing now slide yes sir it is visible sir now 
Now you can continue, sir. Okay. Hello, sir. It's Vidhi, sir. Yeah. See, madam, where where I'm, uh, uh, there is a slide which is visible now. Basic principle and parts of the mass spectrometer. This slide is visible now. Yes, sir. Okay, but uh, when I'm changing the slide, uh, it is not uh, visible. How the when now I'm going for the previous slide. Now I'm moving on to the next slide. Next slide is visible now. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Now basic principles of parts of the spectrophotometer. This is visible now. Yes, sir. Principles okay. not. So background is visible. Background, yeah. Background under that. There basic is principles. Going about the basic principles and parts of the mass spectrometer. That is visible now. Yes. Hello. Yes, sir. It's visible, sir. Yeah. Now please inform me because sometimes there is a slide is not changed. It means then, then there is no meaning because I would be in the different slide, or I am thinking that I am moving to the next slide. So I don't know the reason behind here. But now uh, you propose the slides are not changing. Please inform me so that I will do accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for thank you. that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, please inform me, or you can uh, okay. at any moment if suppose the slides are not changing. Okay, thank you. Thank and you, I will go on the, uh, the basic principle which is available here, but actually uh, the topic which is given uh, for presentation is an interpretations only. But uh, to interpret the uh, interpretation of any organic compounds, so let we should uh, uh, very much well known about the, the mass instrument here. So hence I brought the, this particular slide to well known about the how the LCMS instrument is working here. I told there is a two type of instruments are available, either it may be in uh, your GCMS or maybe the LCMS. And usually there is a, either you can consider about the GCMS or LCMS. So the only the difference here in the case of GCMS, we can take the volatile compounds, which you can uh, able to analyze effectively by using the GCMS. And LCMS is, we can able to analyze the more of polar compounds, it can be more uh, effective analyzed by using the LCMS here. And uh, then uh, you are observing about there is a uh, the information which is available in this particular slide. Okay. See here, I am giving you an information now relatively with the instrumentation only. And there is a when the sample, either there is a question is arises, uh, what is the kind of a samples we are going to bring here? The samples I told either we can going to use the samples of volatile or maybe the non volatile samples we are going to use, and which is going to enter into the ionizer area. So, ionizer area. Hello, sir. Hello? The Hello, sir. Hello? Again, slides are not moving, sir. Please confirm me, the slides are visible now. Slides are moving. Hello. Ha, sir. Now the slides are moving. Just to check it, I am changing the slides. Whether the slides are moving now? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so we are discussing about the uh, different type of uh, the analyzers and as well as uh, these are the major equipments, uh, major parts which is available in the case of your mass and all. 
where there is a sample introduction and followed by there is an ionizer area where in this ionizer area hello hello sir sorry for the interruption sir again uh, the slides are uh, not visible sir. Share the screen, sir. Share the screen. I'm just trying here. So share your entire screen. Now oh, slides are visible. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Sir. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe I was not share the entire screen due to that reason. It was uh, only uh, the maybe the slides are not changing. Okay. Now the slides are moving up and down, right? Right. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. And here in the case of your uh, the mass uh, spectrometry instruments. Uh, the, there are important four important uh, the parts will be there one is an sample inlet the next is an uh, ionizer area where there is a different type of ionizations are going to take place and followed by there is an the followed by there is a mass analyzer you are going to observe you see here in this very clearly uh, the uh, informations are given and uh, so we can see that so this is then where the samples either the sample may be in either uh, the liquid samples are maybe the gaseous sample which are going to introduce into the ionizer area where there are different type of ionization methods are available so the sample will be get converted into an ionized here then it is called as an ionizer area it may be an esi there are uh, electrospray ionization uh, maldi there are so, so many instrument uh, so many ion ionization methods are there sometimes we are going to call it this ionization as a soft ionization maybe the hard ionization remember here in the case of your um, the sample once it is injected into the gcms or maybe the lcms the recovery of the sample is not uh, happen so hence this technique is called as an, one of the destruction technique only because the sample recovery is not possible whereas in rem remaining all the instruments where the re recovery of the sample is possible that is a major difference in the case of your uh, other other instrument like maybe in your uv ir or maybe the other maybe the in, in, in nmr also we can able to recover the sample but about the recovery of the sample in the case of your mass is not possible the reason is that the sample is undergoing the destruction here and you are observing that there is an uh, the one thing you can able to observe here once there is a sample sir get converted into an uh, different type of ions and these ions are moving into the analyzer area okay so we should not supposed to confuse here the ionizers and analyzer so both are different here so ionizer role is for the conversion of the samples into any a different type of ions okay and only of course the positively charged ions are moving into the analyzer area and in the case of analyzer there are different type of analyzers are available so most widely used analyzer like it may be in triple quadrupole or maybe in the time of flight analyzers are available and later the from this analyzer it is going to reach us the detector it may be in uh, different uh, ions which are separated or segregated which are moving into the Uh, detector where they are going for the identification of the ions are going to take place. So, which can be uh, the given uh, in the better way here, which I am showing here. There is a sample either in the form of a liquid sample or maybe the gaseous sample, which can enter here. Okay, there is an the samples either in the liquid or gas. The condition is that for your sample, in the case of uh, uh, entry of the sample made into a compulsory in the form of a vapor only. The vapor samples are entering into the analyzer area. and it is very clear that so your entire uh, analyzer area and as well as ionization chamber are, are in the vacuum area only so this is most important the part where to supposed to remember that so the ions can uh, forms here but the the better moment the path it can able to uh, attain only by using the uh, vacuum only hence there is a vacuum uh, 
uh, is essential to maintain the root of this ions are fragment uh, the whatever the ions which are fragmented can able to reach only in a better path by creating a vacuum only. Hence, so in the case of either you can consider the GCMS or LCMS, the maintaining a vacuum is very, very important. Without uh, maintaining the vacuum, so there is no any question of the separation or segregation or detection is highly impossible. So hence come all you take whichever the instrument, so they are going to make an, the vacuum is created in the area of uh, ionization source as well as in the analyzer area and detector area to uh, segregate the ions which are reaching into the detector. Once there is a ions which are separated in the analyzer area and later these ions. So the question is uh, available here, the later rate of the ions which are separated and which will be reach as fast than the uh, higher molecular weight only. And followed by you are going to observe that. So the mass which are get separated, uh, you are going to get an, the M by Z as an X axis and the relative abundance uh, which is going to get an Y axis and there is a separation of ions are going to take place and based upon their M by Z values that is mass to charge ratio which is considered as a one of the x-axis here and the separation are going to take place and this is a kind of in the, the graph where we can able to see them we'll see the some more uh, graphs and all and uh, coming now slides are changed please confirm me the slide is changed yes sir okay thank you thank yes, you thank you for the slide change uh, then so there are importantly uh, in case of your uh, mass spectrometry there are different type of ions i told there is a formation of ions and these ions are there may be a possibility that the ions which may be attaining in the position of m plus one ion is there or molecular ions are there fragmented ions are there so generally we are going for uh, uh, while we are moving for the lcms or maybe the gcms and we are going to take it into consideration of uh, their basicity of the molecule is attained. So based upon the basicity of the molecules, so we are going to select the positive mode and as well as the negative mode of the uh, negative mode for the separation. And in case of the positive mode, so the compound which are separated are atoms which are separated and which consist of an uh, M plus one which will be there. M plus one nothing but there is a hydrogen atom. Uh, proton is associated with the your molecular ion so hence m plus h is possible in the case of your positive mode so when you are going for the measurement or while you are checking for your molecular weight of the compound usually we are going to get a m plus one will be there so in the case of your positive mode so this we have to be very cautious while you are because if your molecular weight is something 200 is there and if you get a 201 so because you are running in a positive mode and hence so there is a uh, 201 is possible in such cases we should not be get confused and we are supposed to identify that in which mode is going on. So if it is in positive mode, definitely we are going to get an M plus 1. Nothing but M plus 1 is because of the, the proton which is associated here. So hence we are going to get a positive mode. And the second possibility here, so that I told there is a density of the molecule is in questions here. And so there are uh, uh, certain uh, function groups are responsible. While there is a, uh, we cannot able to get an, the fragmentation of the molecules not effectively by using the MOSG mode. And in such cases, there is a mass uh, spectrophotometer who are operating. So they are going to give the data in the negative mode also. So the intention is that the, we can able to get an, uh, the effective fragmentations is also possible in the case of negative mode. And hence, so we have to be careful that, so while you are checking the results of positive mode fragmentation and as well as negative mode fragmentation, and the person who is giving the results for the uh, mass about the any organic compound, they are going to give it in the positive mode results as well as the negative mode intention is that so like it like you can based upon the molecular weight of your compound you can choose and the structure of the molecule uh, structure of the organic compound you can choose which is your correct uh, ideal mass here okay so this is how usually the the routine uh, the practice is going to happen whenever you are given your sample for the mass analysis and if it is synthesized in a laboratory or maybe if you are interested to know about molecular weight of your organic compound and there is a uh, molecular ion so this is considered as a, one of the important ion which is uh, possible because of the molecular weight of the compound so molecular ion means here which is going to losses one electron uh, from the neutral atom when any molecules losses any uh, the, uh, electron and it is going to become electropositive and that we can call it as a molecular ion here so that is a, one of the uh, important ion which is going to give the information about the molecular weight of the compound then followed by we can able to get a base peak of the base peak is one of the important ions we are going to get in the mass 
so that is current correspondingly gives the information about the the stability of the portion which is undergoing the dissociation or fragmentation the stable portion of the molecule and which i am going to get in the form of a the base peak only so usually the base peak is a very intense peak it is available in the case of your mass and followed by we are going to get in fragments here the fragments are uh, usually because of the formation of um, the molecule which are undergoing the cleavage the cleavage is undergoing in uh, the, some certain set of rules only and the cleavage will not undergo according to our will and wish there are some set of rules are there it may be in rules like your nitrogen rule or maybe the hydrogen rule or macular rearrangement or maybe the uh, some of the important rules for the hydrocarbons are there by knowing the fragmentation rules we can able to identify that so this is our organic molecule and this is about the fragmentations so usually the fragments which are obtained are usually electropositive only that is they are positively charged ions which are going to reach us in the detector and can be able to uh, reach us and gives the information accordingly okay and there is a formation of one more important ions is the adducts here adduct is an uh, important concept we have to suppose to identify while you are going for the molecular weight of the compound sometimes there is an uh, in your molecules maybe the sodium ions or maybe some uh, other component which is uh, added uh, along with your molecules maybe you can able to get the some molecular weight of your expected one with an along with the sodium is possible all along with some you can able to get the uh, some important uh, the uh, the salt which may be inter interrupting and you are going to get an adduct here and in such cases we have to be very careful that so where is our molecular weight and molecular weight is get converted into adducts because of the possibility that so it may be connected with your uh, molecular weight with the some other salts also in such cases the expected molecular weight is going to increase because of the addition of the uh, some of the important ions or maybe due to from the buffers and all is possible or maybe you can consider that there may be an uh, sodium ions maybe it is uh, added along with the 23 is going to add it to the molecular weight and you are going to get the plus 23 is possible and dimer is also one of the important possibility that you are going to get in the case of your uh, molecular weight of the compound okay and so this particular uh, the slide which is going to give you a more idea about uh, so what exactly the gcms and lcms is going to be do and in case of your uh, gcms has already expressed that so it is mainly for the determination of the volatile compounds can be effectively analyzed by using the gcms and uh, so uh, the question is coming whenever the people are doing a kind of research and all so which is ms uh, whether a gcms is an appropriate or lcms is an appropriate they have a million dollar question so they thought that both are both are same but usually there is a gcms and lcms is a different one and uh, different uh, applications are there so when your sample is in volatile and in such cases we are supposed to use the the gcms and when suppose if your compound is in polar is there and we have to go for the lcms here okay and when you are using in gcms where there is a uh, different ionizations we are going to get here so that ionization may be an electron ionization that we are going to call as an ea here and there may be a chemical ionization is possible okay and these are the ionization methods which i told there is a uh, sampling light and followed by the ionization methods and analyzer and as well as detector and in the case of ionization methods so we are going to use the electron ionization or maybe the chemical ionization or most widely used in the case of your gcms okay and i told there is a positive and as well as negative and these are all the groups are responsible for the while you are selecting any positive ion mode and as well as negative ion mode for the uh, experiments here okay thank you and so there may be a uh, possibility that there is an uh, uh, the non volatile and in such cases uh, the nothing but in case of your lcms okay in mean in case of your lcms so there are different type of uh, the ionization methods are used it may be an fab or maybe an esi or maybe apci or maybe the maldi maybe in your informal level maybe you are already studied about this in detail about the how exactly the fast the fab is working electrospray is working atmospheric pressure the chemical ionization is working and matrix assisted that is we are going to call as an maldi how it is going to working and all so because i am not going to take in detail about this working of the different uh, ionization methods here so i am concentrating on the more of uh, the interpretation like how the uh, the quantification or identification of the molecule is possible okay so let at this moment keep it in your mind these are the most widely used uh, the ionization methods for the organic molecules is concerned okay again there is one more important thing we are to supposed to identify in the case of our mass is there is a uh, low resolution and as well as high resolution 
so this is another important uh, task in uh, while you are going for the analysis of the uh, the lcms while you are given low the resolution and high resolution is because of your the instrument and followed by their uh, uh, analyzers are important here suppose when you consider only the triple quarter hole is there so there is a q1 so in case of q1 so where you can uh, maybe the, you cannot expect an uh, the high resolution or the effective separation of the molecular weight is difficult in the case of low resolution where in case of high resolution like so in case of you can consider about your triple quarter hole or q top and all where you can able to get an high resolution the separation of the molecules are possible i will show you how exactly the separation is possible and all and so this is going to give you more idea so which is an uh, the analyzers are capable capable to do the results effectively so uh, in the case of your uh, low resolution it is very clear that so there is an quarter pole analyzer or maybe the ion trap analyzers so are most widely used in the case of analyzer for the separation of the molecules and the maybe the separation is possible and you can able to do the uh, you can able to identify the molecular weight of the compound but when you consider about the resolution so the resolution is an uh, it is going to give the more accurate molecular weight of the compound and which can be achieved by using the different type of ion uh, analyzer here so when you consider about the high resolution so here in the case of ftica nothing but four year transfer ion cyclotron resonance so this is one of the effective analyzer where you can able to get an um, uh, the clear separation of the molecular weight of the compound okay or it may be an arbitrary or maybe time of flight or maybe the magnet so these are all the most widely used uh, the analyzer for getting the uh, effective separation and uh, effective resolution so effective resolution of the compound maybe you are already aware about the your hplc and all so we are going to get an hplc separation and all and in that there is sometimes we are going to get an uh, the print end and maybe the uh, print end when you are going to use only the hplc and in such cases there will be an overlapping of the compound overlapping of the compound so in such cases there is an the two peaks are get merged how the uh, how the peak shape will be there in such cases we could not we are finding for the separation and we are doing going for the effective separation of the two component and all in the similar way here so if you wanted to make the effective separation of the compounds by using the mass and it is possible to use the uh, the analyzer which are ftcr or maybe arbitrap and all most widely used so uh, now i'm going Going to give the more information about the how exactly there is an uh, the, uh, uh, electron ionization. Nothing but your ionization techniques are going to produce the different ions here. In the case of positive mode and as well as the negative mode. So I told usually when you are approach with your sample with any uh, mass spectrometry person and they are going to run the both the mode here, positive mode and negative mode because. so they don't have any idea about the what is the molecular weight of the compound what is the structure of the compound and in doing uh, so they are going to do both the ionization method or maybe positive ionization method as well as the negative ionization method irrespective of by uh, understanding about the structure of the compound and we have to be very clear about what is our structure of the compound what are the functional groups are there and based on that we are supposed to uh, go for the positive ion or maybe the negative ion sometimes the results are coming very effectively the positive ion because of the effective separation of the molecules and all and when you see the electron ionization the which is these are the most widely used ionization technique in the case of your gcns that is electron ionization as well as the chemical ionization and we can able to get the in case of your uh, the gcms there is a possibility of adduct ions are going to obtain and similarly there is a case of negative ions also that is negative mode of negative ionization mode also there is a possibility that you are going to get an uh, ions and fragment ions are possible and the difference here just to observe here there may be an uh, additional of the proton is possible in case of your chemical ionization in the gcms and where you can able to observe in the molecular weight with a minus 1 is possible in the case of your negative ionization so this way to keep it in your mind when you are giving any sample analyzing by using negative ionization mode and positive ionization mode so expected molecular weight is going to become increases plus 1 in the case of your positive ionization and in case of your negative ionization so expected molecular weight is uh, with 1 minus is possible that way to supposed to identify in the case of and which mode we are running the spectra and accordingly the results are coming here okay and in case of your uh, the uh, electro electrospray ionization and as well as the atmospheric uh, apci and as well as in case of your uh APPI and MALVI. These are all the most widely used uh, the 
analyzers are used in the case of your the LCMS and all. And these are all the possible uh, the IRs we are going to get it. And suppose if you consider here in the case of your the electro spray ionization, so there may be possibility of the molecular weight with plus one, and as well as there is a plus ammonium ions are possible. And there may be and these are all associated because of you are going to use the your uh, uh, buffers in your preparations. So maybe usually we are going to use the uh, not the any phosphate buffer and all. Only the the maybe uh, the formic acid buffer or maybe the ammoniated buffers are going to use. And in case in such cases, the formic acid buffer or maybe any kind of consist of ammoniated buffers are used. And expected molecular weight is going to increases with plus and with the plus ammonium ions and plus with sodium ion is possible with plus potassium ion is possible. So this way to be very careful while you are analyzing your sample for the uh, electro spray ionization and in such cases these are the additional molecular weights are possible and you should not supposed to confuse that so where is my molecular weight is valid and uh, so we have to be very careful and so this we can able to understand when you run with uh, by knowing it's the fragmentation pattern and all we can able to get a clear information that so uh, the molecular weight of the ex exact molecular weight we can able to identify here and in case of your apci and as well as an atmospheric photo ionization or maybe the maldi these are all the most widely used uh, the analyze uh, the ionization methods in the case of your lcms and all okay and uh, so i am giving in uh, that the clear cut information difference between the when you are going to use the electron ionization and as well as chemical ionization these two power, these are the two type of ionizations are going to be used in the case of your GCMS and all. And this is the mass spec of the compound. Okay, mass spectra of the compound that is three, uh, three four dimethoxy acetophenone is there. And there is a when you see the uh, the electron ionization by using GCMS, how the fragmentation is going to occur here. So you are going to get a molecular weight of this compound is an 180 is there. Okay, you are going to get an uh, the M plus here we are indicating. The M plus is because of it loses at one electron and it is going to become electro positive and hence it is going to get a molecular ions. So that is a positively charged ions are reaches at the uh, usually at the extremely at the end here. Okay. And then remaining all fragments are going to obtain here. So X axis will be your the chemical shift values which are expressed in terms of M by Z values or you can consider the mass to charge ratio. Okay. Or uh, so we can express it uh, here. So mass to charge ratio is possible in the X axis. And y axis is your natural abundance, and here is given they are given as the percentage of the base peak here. Okay. And when you see the the chemical reagent, uh, in case of your GCMS, we are going to use the, the certain type of gases are additionally, and maybe the ethane or methane are going to use, and hence, so because of the in, incorporation of the different uh, the gases into the GCMS and expected molecular weight is increases with the extent of incorporation of the ethane or the propane and the structures are increased so that you are going to get a molecular weight plus one is possible uh, because of the incorporation of the uh, some of the reagent which is increased uh, included and then suppose ethane is used so then directly molecular weight with ethane is possible so these are all the mass spectra is possible so when you are going to use the gcms either the electron ionization or in the case of your chemical ionization and next I will move on to the some more example for you to give the difference, clear difference about the, uh, the electron ionization as well as chemical ionization of the another compound like you can observe about the phenoph phenobarbital and whose molecular weight is 226 is there and you are observing that electron ionization spectrum results in more lower M by Z values. See here there is an, uh, the separation of the IRs which is obtained here. Okay, So where electron ionization is more lower M by Z values, nothing but the peaks are very small is available. Boom. And but when you see here in the case of your chemical ionization, so there is a somewhat difference is there between the uh, the fragment ions which is produced in the case of your chemical ionization because of the incor incorporation of the different ion, different gases into the molecular weight. Hence the molecular weight, expect the molecular weight can increase us. Okay. And uh, so hence we are going to get an, uh, the difference in the mass is possible because of the GCMS here. And so I told there is a uh, resolution wise uh, regarding the MS is concerned. So you are going to observe that there is a uh, resolution which is possible in the case of your MS. This particular slide is going to give an idea, more better idea about so how the low resolution mass spectra will be there and high resolution mass spectra is there. Observe the slide carefully. 
So here there is an x axis is your uh, the chemical shift values only. Sorry, uh, the x axis is your m by z values. So the chemical shift values, sorry, it is there in the number only because just now we saw the number. Uh, the the M, uh, x axis is your m by z values. So where you can able to check the uh, the fragmented ions, and you are going to observe here there is the m by z values are more accurate is possible here. That is mass to charge values uh, are more accurate is possible. Around 783 accurate mass is possible. Okay. And here very accurate mass is possible in the case of the hydrogen mass spectra. And when you are going to take it in the quarter pole with the time of flight. So nothing but when you are going to use the mass instrument with the triple quarter pole and Q off. So where we can able to get the high resolution is possible. Suppose when you are going to use the mass of uh, instrument with an API of 3000 is there. And this is going to appear in some the, in the separation of the ions in the form of a, it has started from 702 and it is end up with 706. And if it is a molecular it is something about, and in such cases it may be lies in between this only. And this problem can be completely eliminated when you are going for the high resolution, high resolution mass spectra. Okay. And so now I'm going to give the more information regarding the, uh, to give the clarity about the, in uh, mass spec where you are going to observe there is a single mass or maybe the triple mass or maybe the mass with q top these are the different uh, instruments we are going to get in the while you are going for analysis of the any samples and all. just this particular slide is going to give an idea about regarding the analysis of the your sample and one you are going to observe here there is a source and followed by there is an analyzer and detector source means your ionization source which will be there in the case of your MS and analyzer, maybe you have triple quarter pole or one Q1 will be there and detector will be there. So this I am calling it as an MS only because here, so there is a only single. So if you wanted to find out the molecular weight of the compound and if you wanted to know uh, in the only this, uh, LCMS you can able to run and from that you can able to get a data about the molecular weight of the compound. But if you wanted to find out their uh, uh, fragmentation patterns and all, so we need to move on to the LCMS MS. Okay. So this is MS MS where it consists of your ionization source and there is a Q1 here. Okay. And here there is a Q3. This is a collision cell. So the collision cell is considered as a Q2 here. So this is a considered as an, one of the triple quarter pole. So this triple quarter pole is one kind of an important analyzer which is going to be used. And so this gives the information that whatever the ions which are produced here, it will be undergoing the again further uh, the cleavage and gives the more idea about the uh, the possibility of the daughter ions are possible and based on that we can able to identify the accurate mass of the compound. So and later the these ions are reaching into the detector only. It may be the other detector or maybe some detector will be there and it is going to give the information about the molecular weight of the compound once the ions are get separated here. Okay. Then followed by there is a some more. Uh, correctly and interestingly and most widely used instruments in the case of the uh, LCMS MS or GCMS MS instruments are uh, consist of not only the single uh, analyzer uh, now they are going to include the one more better one so by introducing the triple quarter pole with a uh, time of flight here so when you are including the uh, analyzer uh, in the by combining the two analyzer one is an cute off okay uh, this is Q1 and this Q2 and Q3 this is an cute off and if you wanted to include any time of flight, so you are going to get a still effective separation and high resolution is possible. Moving on to the, uh, the triple quarter pole with the Q drop, Q uh, top with uh, uh, that is triple quarter pole with the time of flight. The difference here, it is very clear that so we are going to use this, the single quarter pole here. Here triple quarter pole was used. Here with the triple quarter pole with the, uh, one more time of flight is used. And there is a one more uh, ion drop is also correctly available for the analysis of the sample. So these are all the different uh, uh, instruments are available, which you can able to give the more accurate result, more uh, high result uh, the component the spectra is possible by referring the uh, instruments here. So the, we are supposed to uh, moving on to the any particular uh, the sample or instruments where to know about what is our interested application, whether we want to know about only the molecular weight of the compound or whether we want to know about uh, their uh, uh, fragmentation pattern and all in such cases we have to select accordingly okay so now i move on to the uh, 
giving the more information uh, which I given about the instrument now. So now I'm moving on to the, the theory which is involved here. Uh, you are aware that so when any molecules uh, uh, bombarded with an uh, electron impact ionization uh, by using in suitable uh, uh, electrons that is minus 70 electron volt which is impinged on the organic molecules so that we are going to get an, the formation of ions only here. And this formation of ions with the loss of an electron, it is going to become electropositive here. So this electropositive ion, which is formed initially because of the loss of the electron, and that time call it as a molecular ion only. Okay. And this is an electron which is impinged to n molecules, okay, bombarded. And hence, so this is a molecular ion is possible. Okay. And then followed by you are going to observe that there is an uh, some more example I brought here. There may be a possibility that you are going to get a different type of fragments are possible. Observe here, there is a simple example I have taken is an your ethane here. So this ethane, which consists of your C2H6, and we are bombarded with an electron that minus 70 electron volt, we are going to bombard it to the molecules. That is in the your uh, ionization methods. So there are different ionization methods. Suppose you consider that an electron is uh, electron impact ionization or electron ionization, electrospray ionization, where we are bombarded with the molecules. There is a formation of ions okay observe here there is a formation of the positively charged ions okay or maybe and with the loss of one nitrogen you are going to get an electropositive atom of minus uh, uh, m by z of 29 is possible and there may be formation of radical ions are there and there may be possibility of the still more cleavage is possible okay see with the loss of uh, one electron you are going to get a molecular ion here with the loss of one proton it is going to become m by z of 29 and there is a fragmentation which is going to take place because of the fragmentation of this particular sigma bond, okay, rupture, and you are going to get in the m by z of 15 is possible, okay. And remember here only the positively charged ions are moving into the uh, analyzer area or uh, the detector area, not into the, uh, not the any uh, the radical ions are then not detected by using the LCMS here. Uh, the because the electron impact is in uh, or maybe any kind of an uh, the technique we are going to use here the formation of ions are maybe positively charged ions or maybe the negatively charged ions are three radicals only the positively charged ions are moving into the next level and reaching into the analyzer area and where analyzers are going to give in uh, the better ion better separation is possible that is an analyzer area is uh, into uh, individual ions based upon their mass to charge ratio and reaches it to the detector here. And uh, so this is again the it is going to give in more information about the negative and the positive ion mode. Of course, I given the, uh, the information regarding the negative ion and as well as the positive ion here. But uh, so I give the clear, clear clarity about which is in soft ionization, which is in hard ionization, and which is in the uh, when you consider about your soft ionization, your electrospray ionization is in consideration and as well APCA are considered as one of the stop, soft ionization is possible. And where you can consider about your, uh, that uh, in case of your tandem mass and that, we are going to use the different uh, analyzer where which can, uh, the molecules can be break down into an, uh, uh, ions where we could not be able to get a suitable library is uh, difficult. In such cases, it becomes very difficult. I can call it as a hard ionization technique of, uh, is created by that. Okay. And with the followed by here, uh, I'm going to give the more information, more clarity about the different types of ions, which is going to be possible. One that might be, I told there is a molecular ion, plus one is possible, uh, plus two is possible. And this is because of your um, isotope, which is responsible here. So most of the element occur naturally as a mixture of isotopes here. The presence of significant amount of heavier isotopes leads to a small peaks that have any masses that are higher than the parent ion peak and hence you are going to get an, the m plus 1 is possible. Why there is m plus 1 and m, m plus 2? So that is because of the formation of your isotope which is possible in that. As you are aware, uh, aware that there is a uh, molecules are associated with the different isotopes are possible for the atoms. So those ito isotopes are responsible for the m plus 1 ion and m plus 2 ions here. Okay. And so this particular slide is going to give the more idea about the what are all the different type of the molecular ions and m plus 1 ions and m plus 2 ions. So this is important uh, information we are supposed to consider when there is a mass spectra is given. Uh, the contribution from the proton, carbon, nitrogen and oxygen, fluorine, sulfur, chlorine 
and bromine you are observed here these are all the atoms okay which they have the responsible isotopes are there whichever the atoms their isotopes are in the significant amount can responsible for contributing the m plus 1 and m plus 2 contributions are possible the expected molecular weight with plus 1 is possible plus 2 is possible and the plus 1 contribute so when you consider about the molecular weight so here in the proton there are about the, the two isotopes are possible for the your hydrogen is concerned one is in deuterium ion another one is in tritium is possible amount of the natural abundance of the deuterium is only 0.013% is there and when you consider about the your tritium so that is very negligible amount is there and hence so hydrogen is very negligibly giving the m plus 1 contribution because of the low natural abundance and whatever the proton you are going to get it that is because of the 99.9 is because of your proton only and not because of your isotopes of uh, the deuterium or maybe the tritium here coming to the carbon 12 so again there is a carbon 12 carbon which is having the two isotope is possible carbon 13 and carbon 14 and in case of your carbon 13 the carbon 12 is natural abundance is 99.98 percent is your carbon 12 is there but whereas carbon 13 1.1 percent of uh, there is a natural abundance of the carbon 13 is there and carbon 14 is again not much interfering because the amount of carbon 14 as a natural abundance is very uh, low as are expressed in terms of ppm so we can neglect the contribution of the carbon 14 as an m plus 2 but we have to consider the m plus 1 contribution from the carbon is possible because 1.1 percent of the carbon 13 is uh, possible because of the m, m plus 1 here okay and possibly in the case of your nitrogen atom and there is a one isotope is possible nitrogen that is one nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15 uh, observe the the natural abundance of the nitrogen nitrogen 14 here it is 99.6 is there but whereas nitrogen 15 it is 0.3 is there so the amount of the uh, nitrogen nitrogen 15 is 0.3 percent 0.366 very low natural abundance when you compare with the nitrogen hence there may be possibility that you can generally expect uh, some amount of the contribution is nitrogen is possible because of the m plus 1 contribution is possible for the nitrogen uh, because of the 0.36 percent of the nitrogen n uh, nitrogen 15 is present here and coming to the oxygen where in the case of oxygen it is very clear that oxygen 16 is there 17 and 18 these two are isotopes and we have to check about their uh, natural abundance, the percentage. It is very clear that iso, uh, oxygen 17 and oxygen 18, oxygen 17 is where you can consider 0.37. There again, we can consider that. So M plus 1 contribution from the oxygen 17 is very less because their amount is less here. And when you consider about the oxygen 18, so definitely the oxygen 18 can give the contribution because of the presence of the 0.2% of oxygen is there. Okay, so hence oxygen can able to give the M plus 1 contribution and as well as M plus 2 contributions are possible. So these are important uh, informations which I am delivering here for, for the contributions of the uh, isotopes. Okay, how the isotopes can give the uh, additional molecular weight because of the presence of the, so the respective atoms isotopes here. And one more here in the interestingly, the sulfur is also, but fluorine doesn't have any isotopes here so that you need not worry about the any fluorine containing compound where so that that uh, suppose the fluorine is there so you are going to get directly the natural abundance is 100 percent is there so that isotope is not there and coming to the sulfur there is a sulfur 32 33 is there and as well as 34 when you see the uh, their m plus 1 contribution for the sulfur 33 and sulfur 34 for the m plus 2 contributions so there is a m plus 2 contribution for the uh, sulfur 34 is there 4.22 percent of the uh, m plus 2 contribution is possible definitely we can say that the sulfur is going to give the m plus 1 contribution as well as the m plus 2 contribution is possible because of the more amount of the natural abundance and coming to the chlorine the chlorine is a very interesting atom here because of the isotopes uh, chlorine 35 is there and chlorine 37 and here the isotope of the chlorine 37 and the natural abundance of the Chlorine 37 is 25, 24.2. Almost it is in when you see the natural abundance of the chlorine 35 and chlorine 37 is uh, uh, 1 is to 3 is there. Nothing but so the 25 percent of the ions are in the uh, chlorine 30, 37 is there and 75 percent of the ions are in the 
uh, 35 ions are there so hence we are going to get definitely the m plus 2 ions and these are easily we can able to recognize in the ions uh, m plus 2 ions when you are run any organic molecules which consist of chlorine in it and another interesting ion uh, atom here is the bromine observe here the bromine so bromine containing any organic molecules we have to be very careful uh, because th there is a bromine uh, which is having an one isotope is possible there is a bromine 79 and bromine 81 is there and here in the case of your uh, the mass number of the uh, your bromine uh, 79 and 81 here there is a equal contribution is there so the when you see the the natural abundance of the bromine 49.3 almost it is in 50 i can consider and 50 from the 79 is possible any bromine containing organic molecules can give the m plus 2 contributions and you are going to get an m plus 2 peak and intensity of the m plus 2 peak will be equal is there so molecular ion peak plus m plus 2 peak is with the equal intensity is possible but when you see the chlorine and here the molecular ion peak and as well as m plus 2 peak one is to three ratio is there so we have to consider based on this only we can able to get in some idea so this is a chlorine containing uh, uh, compound or it may be bromine containing compound which, which we can able to come to conclusion okay so interpretation of an any organic molecule is possible uh, when you know these are the interesting uh, the ions and their natural abundance so here i brought the some interesting example like where ethanol is there and their ethanol with an uh, mass spec i brought here so that uh, molecular m by z that is mass to charge ratio is in your x axis and relative intensity or relative abundance we are going to get in the y axis and with the molecular weight of this ethanol is in 45 is there okay and so 46 is there and you are going to get the molecular ion peak extremely at the right here okay and with the loss of one hydrogen atom okay you are going to get in 45 here so i am giving in complete the fragmentation pattern for the simple ethanol here which is going uh, different fragments are possible extremely at the end when you are going to observe any mass spec we have to concentrate directly on the right side of the mass spec and what is that so that is here interestingly at the right you are going to get then molecular ion peak and rest are all the completely the fragment ions only. so the fragmentation is going to take place i told in the beginning there is an uh, uh, interestingly we are undergoing the some sort of uh, rules are there based upon the rules there is a cleavage is possible and so here in this case we are going to get in the molecular ions their fragmentation ions and there is an important uh, the base peak is possible so uh, the base peak is one where intensity of the peak is very high uh, among the uh, your uh, fragments so that time call it as a base peak here and this is your uh, the molecular ion peak okay and rest all are considered as any your fragment ion peaks or fragment ions or maybe the dot ions so these are all called as a dot ions here and significantly one interesting uh, the base peak is possible the base peak is one which is uh, uh, because of you are observing here cs2oh okay the cs2oh uh, which is obtained because of the formation of the important stable portion of the your ethanol only and hence so you are going to get an the interesting peak is possible and that i am getting uh, that you are going to observe here is then uh, the 31 okay the 31 is the important the base peak and uh, just to observe the all are the ions they are all positively charged only okay either it may be in your methane cs3 or c2s2 or cs3 these are all you are observing that they are all completely positively charged ions are there only the positively charged ions are going to give the the response in the mass spec okay and so here uh, we have to be very uh, clear about regarding whenever there is a molecules like a mass spectra uh, if it is in bromine containing atoms and all so uh, as we are already realized that m plus 2 contribution is possible definitely from the uh, any bromine containing compounds here and here i brought an one example here is a two bromopropane is there observe the structure carefully and this is then uh, two bromopropane and the molecular weight of this compound is 123 is there okay and 123 you got here as a molecular ion and it is very clear that any bromine containing molecules can give the m plus 2 contribution which i already stated so m plus 2 is possible because the bromine 79 and bromine 81 is there so 79 and 81 equally intensity is possible from this it is very clear that there is a m plus 2 peak is there and this is because of the 125 because of the m plus 2 contributions so in this way we can able, we can able to recognize 
so the different type of ions okay different type of ions and their uh, their intensity the peak intensity it is in clue whether the molecule is in bromine containing molecules or chlorine containing molecules or nitrogen containing molecules and molecular weight is also giving a very significant uh, information here so here i brought the one more example for you the chlorine containing molecules here there is a chlorine containing i already told that the chlorine 35 and 37 chlorine 35 is in uh, uh, so almost 75 the uh, uh, portion is there nothing but natural abundance is 70% is there and chlorine 37 is in 25% and here it is very clear that so in the case of your the chlorobenzene molecular weight is in the comp molecular weight of this compound is 112 is there okay and there is m plus 2 is possible because of the formation of the 37 35 and 37 hence the molecular weight is increases to m plus 2 and you are going to get 112 and as well as 114 is possible and we have to be very careful by such type of ions which are produced here so this is because of your molecular ions okay and whenever there is any intensity of the among the peak which is stable that i call it as an sometimes so your base peak your molecular ion is itself is going to become base peak from this it is very clear that so molecular ion itself is going to become base peak sometimes you are going to become one of the fragment the stable portion is going to become base peak and followed by there is a from this it is very clear that there is an intensity of the molecular ion peak as well as the m plus 2 is 1 is to 3 is there from this it is very clear that it is a chlorine containing compound and below you are going to get in what are all the fragments are possible okay uh, from this it is very clear that there is a 77 is because of loss of chlorine here because of this loss of chlorine that is 35 and chlorine is a negatively charged ions it is not uh, produced any ions here for your kind information any chlorine peak is not visible here because it is a negatively charged ions only the positively charged ions are reaches in the detector and uh, response is possible okay and you are observing that there is an uh, these are all the different uh, fragment ions which is possible in the case of your chloromenzene and now i will give the some more idea about how there is a uh, the sulfur can contribute and sulfur uh, is also contributing m plus 2 peaks and all and here is in uh, the simple molecule sulfur containing molecule is there so where you can able to get the four percent of the uh, m plus 2 contributions are possible and here this is a molecular weight of the compound and this is an m plus 2 uh, peak is possible because of the presence of the uh, the natural abundance nothing but m plus 2 peak is possible for the sulfur here and there is an iodine containing molecule so here is an uh, uh, the simple iodo astonatural is there so this is a molecular weight of this compound is 166 is there and you are getting exactly uh, as uh, already aware that iodine doesn't have any isotopes and we are going to get a very clear uh, the separation uh, is possible and which you can able to understand here there is a large gap is there between your molecular uh, weight and as well as its uh, fragments and from this we can able to assume that so the iodine this is a molecule which consists of iodine containing compound that is an iodostonatrel okay and now i'll move on to the some more information regarding the uh, uh, fragmentation pattern is concerned that is uh, imagine when you are going for the why there is an m plus 1 m plus 2 are important in the case of your mass spec for the interpretation for, uh, and all i uh, suppose we consider in case of your methane and in the methane we can expect that 9800 molecules are belongs to the carbon 12 is there but when you see the the carbon 13 there is 110 is because of the 110 molecules are possible when you consider 10000 molecules here there is 110 is molecules are because of the c13 molecules are there and there is a c14 the carbon atom is also possible in the methane and their contribution is very less is there okay and so you are going to get an m plus 1 ion uh, because of the presence of there is a carbon 13 is there okay like this is an idea is going to give that how there is a the peak and peak intensity will be there it is going to give the information so if your compound is an hydrocarbon is there so you are going to get a molecular peak and so the expectation of the m plus 1 peak because of the carbon is very uh, possible because as the carbon number is increases i think this is an uh, information is going to give the more clarity about uh, when there is an uh, the compound suppose if we consider the ethane c2h6 and there is a molecular ion you are going to get an 100 percent and there is m plus 1 co uh, contribution is possible that is 2.2 percent so m plus 1 is possible for this compound because the carbon is an consists of an isotopes here carbon 13 is possible and the carbon 13 
the amount as the amount of carbon content is increases so the m plus one m plus one intensity is increases here you are observing that there is a 6.6 percent is then contributing because of the increase in the amount of carbon here hence you are observing that there is a intensity of the m plus one peak is increases so this we have to note down while you are going for the interpretation of the organic molecule and we should also take into consideration of the nitrogen sulfur in the while you're going for the m plus one contributions here uh, so this particular the, the slide is going to give the more idea about uh, so how to identify the m plus two contributions and now uh, the sulfur chlorine bromine and all is going to give the interesting m plus two uh, peak is possible from this it is very clear that there is a sulfur containing molecules can give the uh, m plus two contribution with the ratio of 4 is to 4 and you can consider that in case of your chlorine there is an uh, the intensity of the peak is 31 is possible because of the m plus 2 and in case of your bromine containing molecules it is very clear that there is an uh, m plus 2 peak's contribution is uh, equal is there almost 100 percent is there so it is very clear that mass spectra of the molecule consists of sulfur chlorine and bromine and a significant m plus 2 contributions are possible and this is an uh, interesting day i brought uh, uh, one more uh, uh, structure that is one more uh, the compound here so here this is an isochloropropane is there and here in this isochloropropane so i am showing the uh, because this compound is consist of chlorine in it uh, so you are going to get a molecular weight of this compound is 78 is there and the 80 is also possible because of the m plus 2 contribution because of the chlorine 35 37 here okay because of the chlorine 37 so you, the molecular weight is uh, plus 2 is possible and observe the intensity of the peaks here m plus 2 contribution is possible and there m plus 2 the intensity is observed here 3 is to 1 is there okay this is interesting one okay and next i move on to the one more example uh, that is in uh, uh, molecule with an bromopropane is there here so in this bromopropane so the molecular weight of this compound is 122 is there okay and you are observing that there is an uh, m plus 2 contribution is possible for the bromine uh, from this, it is very clear that intensity of the bromine, that is one is an 79 and another one is an 81. So that isotope of the bromine is an uh, 81 is possible, the intensity of the bromine containing compound. So it is uh, the two peaks, the molecular end peak and as well as M plus 2 peak, the intensity of the M plus 2 peaks are equal is there. From this, it is clear that this compound is consist of bromine is there in that. And hence, so this kind of an, uh, possibilities are expected. Okay, uh, then we can able to see the some more example here. Suppose uh, you are going to get in molecules in this fashion. Uh, so here uh, the bulk weight is 78 is there, and this is the mass spec. And when you see the any mass spec with the bulk weight of 78, and there is a possibility that we can able to expect. So only by using the bulk weight we cannot be able to establish the structure of the compound. And we have to suppose to identify their fragmentation ion and fragmentation pattern and their uh, uh, different type of ions which is going to produce from it. Okay. And here I'm giving them some clue uh, before we are going for the fragmentation rules here. So the bulk weight of this compound is 78 is there. From this 78, I can able to propose the these are all the possible molecular formula. Either C2H6O3 or C3H7 chlorine or C5H4 nitrogen and C6H6. Okay. So these are all the possible molecular weight you can able to establish. But now question is coming, which is appropriate one here. And there is a, some rules are there. There are some rules are there where, where we can able to identify this kind of an structure by knowing its by knowing its molecular weight and all. Uh, whenever there is a molecular weights are going to produce this for a certain uh, compound. Uh, behind that, so we have to note down their molecular weight, and that molecular weight is going to give the clue of uh, clue regarding the number of carbon present and number of nitrogen present in that. I hope you are understanding that we are establishing the structure of the compound, and these are all the very much essential. Which one? There is a important. Uh, the rules are coming. It may be a nitrogen rule, or maybe the hydrogen rule, or maybe a kind of a set of maclevator rearrangement. So, which is going to give the information regarding the the structure of the compound here. Okay. So, the interesting one here is then your the nitrogen rule. Observe the molecular weight of the compound here. So, this is a simple uh, ammonia in S3, and ammonia which is having molecular weight is 17 is there. Okay. 
and when you see the ns2 ns2 that is a simple hydrogen and this small clavet is 32 is there and when you are going for the this particular molecules where there is a nitrogen please go on observing the nitrogen content in all the structures here the nitrogen content is one and the nitrogen number here is two nitrogen number in this here is a three is there and the nitrogen number here is a four is there from this so when you observe the molecular weight of the ammonia and the nitrogen number is in odd is there and the molecular weight of this compound is odd is there and here interestingly there is a molecular weight of this compound is 32 and it is an even only so even molecular weight is having an even number of nitrogen in it and when you see the molecular weight of this compound is an odd is there and the number of nitrogen which is present in the molecule is odd is there and interestingly here there is a 194 is there and molecular weight is in the uh, your uh, m by z value that is molecular ion is an even is there and there is a nitrogen content in that even is there nothing but uh, the the it is gives some more idea that the by observing the molecular weight of the compound we can able to confirm that the number of nitrogen present in that molecule is even or odd if it is a even number of molecular weight is there number of nitrogen present in, the, in that molecule is even only okay so here it is very clear that so this is constitute the nitrogen i hope you are understanding uh, following this one so this is a very interesting one and uh, so this is going to give us uh, very much information uh, in establishing the structure of the compound whether the nitrogen is uh, uh, number can be calculated or number can be identified only uh, remember here the nitrogen number can be guessed whether it is an even is there or odd is there possible and count is difficult whether 10 is there 5 is there we cannot count here but we can able to count from this nitrogen rule the number is an odd is there or even is possible from this rule and this rule is called nitrogen rule i will give you one more example under the nitrogen rule here this is an uh, uh, you are observing there is a molecular weight of this is nitrogen containing in this particular molecule is here uh, observing that there is an odd uh, molecular weight is there nothing but only one nitrogen is there and molecular weight of this compound is only 41 is there so we can suspect that the molecule consists of one nitrogen atom or odd nitrogen atom is present okay so this is again uh, in this structure there is a nitrogen atoms are only one is there and molecular weight molecular ion peak the molecular ion uh, is odd is there so it gives an, some idea that so there is an uh, only one night only one odd number of nitrogens are present in that and another one here in this again the same thing only and this is going to give the fragmentation pattern is possible what are the different type of ions which are going to produce when this particular ion undergoing the fragmentation so we are going to get and only the positively charged ions are reaching into the detector and 72 and 44 and 86 these are all the different type of ions are possible and uh, by knowing the this particular uh, which i gave in the beginning there are different formula i was established by using the formula, we can able to uh, subtract one formula from this. Uh, can anybody give us an answer here uh, from this? Which formula can be eliminated from this? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah, from yes, this. So, uh, can anybody can guess because my nitrogen rule is applicable only by giving the answer at this moment. Can anybody guess here which formula can be eliminated among this? Okay, I will not take more time because so here one. Hello. Uh, so there is a there is a molecular weight is an even is there. So the night this particular formula can be eliminated because the nitrogen number in this is an odd is there. So I am removing that particular formula here. So in this way we can able to you know, predict the. Uh, the number of nitrogen atom present in that by using this. Uh, so I'm moving on to the hydrogen rule here. So how many hydrogens are possible? We can able to uh, predict by using the mass spectra and by knowing it's the formula itself. Uh, from this, uh, it is very clear that so there is a uh, C6H14. There is a number of hydrogen atom, hydrogen atom present in this molecules. R14 is there. So here there is a carbon six is there and hydrogen 14 so there is a maximum hydrogen for the six carbon atom is hydrogen this is following the your cn h2n plus 2 the formula only simple hydrocarbon formula is followed 
and whenever there is a formula is suppose if it is given in the c6h12 so c6h14 is a saturated molecule and c6h12 is an unsaturated molecule i am saying here why it is an unsaturated molecules because the expected molecular weight by following the cnh2n plus 2 formula is not followed here but whereas here the C, there is a one two shortage of hydrogen atoms are there so by observing the one pi bond in this structure so this is a saturated molecules and c6h14 is possible and here in this there is a one pi bond is there in this structure and then there is a two shortage of hydrogen atom is there and so you are going to get a two shortage of hydrogen atom and the expected molecular weight expected number of hydrogen atom is reduced to two only so it is very clear that c6h14 is your saturated compound c6h12 is then uh, from the it is not uh, it is from this it is, it is very clear that the this particular formula uh, giving an information that the particular structure is consist of one unsaturation group is there okay and suppose so expected one is an hydrogen count in this expected there is a two hydrogen count is there so if suppose there is a shortage of two hydrogen count and one unsaturated group is possible if suppose there is a shortage of four hydrogen atom shortage of four hydrogen atom there may be possibility of the two unsaturation or may be because of the two pi bond system or may be the possibility that and uh, from this so c6h10 is there so c6h10 it is very clear that expected is c6h14 is there and c6h10 is there there is a shortage of four hydrogen atom we can suspect that in the given structure there may be any two unsaturation group or may be possibility of the triple bond here nothing but carbon carbon triple bond is possible so the carbon carbon triple bond is also can use the information that in that molecular weight with the shortage of two four hydrogens are possible okay so i will move on to the uh, some interesting uh, examples here so i am exceeding the time madam hello hello sir no you can go for 10 more minutes 10 minutes sir madam i can i can take the 10 more minutes no problem yes sir yes, sir. okay okay thank you and interestingly here there is a unsaturation can also brought by the uh, ring also so it is very clear that so from this there is a previously we confirmed that there is a one unsaturation group can reduce us to two hydrogen so that is not true sometimes in the given structure in the given formula if suppose there is a one ring is possible in such cases also there is a shortage of two hydrogen atoms are possible okay and if suppose there is a two rings are there and the shortage of four hydrogen atoms are possible okay so in this way suppose when you consider the nitrogen atom present in that so the nitrogen atom this is the c6h14 that is the maximum hydrogen possible for six carbon six carbon atom is 14 is there and here if suppose there is a one nitrogen atom is present in a given structure and formula is here like this that is c6h15n is there so c6h15 so from this it is very clear that the nitrogen containing compound or nitrogen atom is present in a given molecule can give the contribution in the increase in the number of hydrogen atom so previously we observed that there is a two two shortage of hydrogen atom gives the one unsaturation and one hydrogen atom is increased here and because of the presence of one nitrogen atom and if suppose there is a two nitrogen atoms are there in the given formula and it is it is clear that there is a hydrogen atom number is increased to two here so this is how we are supposed to understand the concept of uh, the here this is a hydrogen group so this is called as an hydrogen group uh, so i hope you are understanding the concept what i am going to give here so each nitrogen increases the maximum hydrogen count by one and for carbons and nitrogen the maximum number can be contributed in this way okay if suppose there is a nitrogen atom is not there so then you are going to get 2c plus 2 only regarding the number of uh, the proton is concerned and if suppose there is a nitrogen is there so in such cases in your formula the hydrogen count can be taken plus 1 uh so that uh, you can able to uh, assume that so there is a one nitrogen atom is present accordingly if suppose there is a one nitrogen one hydrogen count is increased uh, now i'll move on to the some more fragmentation for the alkanes and alkenes and all 
uh, quite interestingly here there is a you know uh, some of the interesting uh, the alkanes are also undergoing the effective the fragmentations are possible so alkanes can do the uh, fragmentation like we are going to observe that simple hydrocarbons can do the contribution with a molecular weight with a loss of 15 is possible when there is a methyl group is lost in the hydrocarbon if suppose in a given molecular formula if suppose there is a methyl group is uh, uh, cleavage in that cases you are going to get a uh, molecular ion with minus 29 is possible and minus 43 for the propyl and minus i mean minus means with molecular weight of minus 57 so these are all the the number uh, the values we have to remember which are contributing for the your methyl group and ethyl group and as well as propyl and as well as butyl group. and this is one of the interesting example here i brought here that is a two methyl pentane and from this two methyl pentane it is very clear that so molecular weight of this compound is because this is a completely hydrocarbons there is no any contribution uh, you can expect, uh, but here in this case, the 86 is there, but there is no any, uh, the 87 is, because 86 molecular ion peak is intensity is very low is there. So just assume that how you are going to expect the, uh, the M plus 1 contribution because of the, the carbon atom present in that, okay. Hence, here it is very clear that the molecular weight of this compound is an 86 here and the 71 and 57 is possible because of the cleavage of your methyl group and because of the cleavage of ethyl group and because of the cleavage of the propyl group and alkenes can give the important contributions uh, in the fragmentation of the mass here they are going to be the methyl ion cations here and which is molecular weight of the 55 is possible and here i brought an example that is trans to exene and molecular weight of this compound is in 84 and 55 is the base pick and whenever any alkene are there we are going to get an important uh, the allylic carbocations are possible. Allylic carbocations are possible, and this is the how there is the allylic carbocations are possible for this compound is explained here. Okay, and so I'm moving on to the one more interesting uh, aromatic compounds. Okay, in case of your uh, any uh, benzene containing compound or any benzene substituted compounds are there, and here I brought an example of your benzyl bromide. Okay, this is the benzyl bromide and aromatic compound. Where you are going to observe that this is the structure of this uh, compound, okay, C6HYCS3. So this is C CS2Br. This is the benzyl bromide, and this is a benzyl bromide with a loss of one electron. It is going to become molecular ion. Here, usually molecular ions are indicated with a square bracket with the plus and the uh, radicals are uh, plus with charges are mentioned like this. So in this way, so usually we are representing the molecular ion representations, okay, and whenever there is any aromatic compound with the substitution of an alkyl group so from, it is from this it is very clear that so there is a formation of uh, intramolecular rearrangement there is a formation of benzylic carbons are formed and this benzylic carbocations are formed because of the rearrangement of the uh, your benzene ring with methyl group here what is going to happen here is there is a formation of uh, carbocations that is because of the tropilium ion is obtained here. So instead of six member ring of this compound, it is get converted into seven member ring with any position. If this methyl group or any alkyl substitution may be present in any uh, the position or in substituted, and this is going to become uh, the seven member six member ring is get converted into seven member ring. The seven member ring is a very stabilized portion of the structure, and that is a 91 is possible. So this is very interesting. That is the uh, this is a tropilium ion, the carbocation which is produced uh, in the case of your any benzene containing compounds here. And this is another example for the same compound only. And this is a uh, uh, nitrobenzene containing compound where you cannot expect any tropilium ion here because there is no any methyl group here. This is an only the nitro group is there. Hence, you are going to get an uh, your uh, the C six H five and which is represented and the molecular weight of this compound is a one one twenty three. That is your nitrobenzene. And there is an even alcohol can give the important contribution with a minus uh, molecular weight with minus 17 is possible or minus 18 is possible, maybe because of your hydroxyl radical or maybe because of the water and all. And interestingly, the primary alcohols can give the interesting uh, ions like CS2H, which is an MYZ value of 31 is possible. Okay, And this is an, uh, the same compound which I am expressing about the propanol and molecular weight of this compound. Uh, it is an 60 is there, okay, and there is a with the loss of your CS2H, okay. So you are going to get an uh, ions around 40, 42. You are going to get here, and this is how there is a fragmentation is possible for the any alcohol containing compound. 
amines and all it's going undergoing again uh, the fragmentation which is going to produce the important iminium ions here which this are all the imini important iminium ions with a molecular weight of the 72 and here there is a possibility that there may be a possibility of alpha cleavage is possible alpha cleavage means so this may be an either you can expect the cleavage this one or this one both are possible and in such cases so you are going to get an the suitable uh, the m by z value for the iminium ion here so this is a suitable iminium ion with a uh, positively charged ions are possible whenever there is a amines containing molecules okay. and this is an example for your uh, amine containing compound and this is again ether ether can give the oxonium an important oxonium ion here and the followed by ether, ether can give the interestingly the important ions are possible from the ether, the 74 and 59, where you are going to observe the important carbocations are possible from yes. the ions and aldehydes can give the elevation like this. Okay. Okay, this is how I think uh, sir. Hello. Sir, yes, sir. Yeah. Can you able to hear my voice? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, madam. Absolutely, I am hearing. Okay. This is, I think, one, okay. or two, one or two slides only. No problem, madam. Okay. No problem. Yeah, no problem. I'm Continue. Going to almost to the end of the presentation uh, because of the okay. different groups are there and how they are undergoing uh, the fragmentation. Actually, one or two slides are there. I'm completing. Okay. And here there is an aldehydes. Uh, so they are going to give the fragmentation pattern for the aldehydes and ketone. The important fragmentation is possible within the loss of nitrogen. Bulk weight within minus one is possible from the aldehydes and and there is a possibility that there is a methane group is get uh, lost and hence you are going to get an, a kind of an, uh, the cleavage is possible in this way. And here is a uh, clear cut idea about uh, your hydro, uh, hydrocinamaldehyde. So this is a structure and the followed by the molecular weight of this compound is 134. And interestingly, this compound is having a CST group is connected with this uh, benzene ring. Hence there is a possibility that there is a formation of uh, the carbocations because of the uh, tropilium ion is possible. The 91 is an interesting, uh, uh, the say seven membered ring is found here. Okay, this is where it is supposed to identify whenever there is an uh, the 91 is possible, and that may be a possibility of the, the carbocation like tropilium ion is there, that is because of the 91. Okay, and here there is a the cleavage is going to occur with the loss of nitrogen or with a loss of uh, that uh, uh, carbon. Okay. Uh, then, so there is a ketones also going to give us some mausoleum ion here, and there is an uh, example of the ketones and esters going to give us some important fragmentations with a loss of alkoxy, loss of an alkoxy group, and with an, a loss of an alkyl. And example where I'm going to give the simple ester is here, and you can observe the molecular of this compound, and important fragments are available. As there is a, uh, there is no any uh, uh, tropilium ion here because there is no any S2 group here. From this, we can be able to observe that. So there is a substitution is not the uh, alkyl group, but it is a uh, keto group is there. So there is a one more interesting here. There is a macro here. There is a here. Uh, again, uh, uh, interesting uh, topic where uh, macro of non-hydrogen to the carbon and oxygen atom and thereby it's almost reaching one of life. Okay. And so this is an uh, important here in the case of maclevet rearrangement. There is a transfer of this gravity addition to the oxygen atom of the compound and there is a formation of one stable portion of the ions are possible. And this is because of your elimination. Okay. Uh, here is a, some example which I am quoted, going to quote here. So this is an example where we are going to observe that. So uh, this then gamma hydrogen is possible. This gamma hydrogen can transfer to the oxygen atom of this compound, and there is a formation of the stable ions. Interestingly, you are going to get an you are going to get as your carbocations. This is a more example which I am going to give about the macrophyte rearrangement. This is more example. For ketone with gamma hydrogen atoms are undergoing. Intermolecular rearrangement. So this is again the rule of the thing. 
where we can able to identify the carbon and identify the carbon by throwing it uh, in the carbon and hydrogen. And just to divide the with the carbon by 30, we are going to get the number of carbon atoms. By taking into the numerator, you the one, you are going to get the number of hydrogen atoms. Here is an example. Here is an example. Number of is and when you divide it so that you are going to get the number of carbon atoms. And the remainder is oh, six only, so that you are going to get the number of carbon atoms. Hydrogen atom can be counted. And if you have taken an example of 92, so it is remainder is n is there. So from this, it is very clear that n plus one, so that you are going to get an, uh, the number of uh, hydrogen atom can be counted in this way. So uh, interestingly, there is an, uh, the Nobel Prize is given uh, for the discovery of the uh, uh, electrospray ionization and laser ionization in 2022. Uh, by the some scientists, or some scientists. so uh, these are all the contributions they made from the university. That is from the Virginia University, followed by there is a foundation. They are made in laser oil, laser oil, Nobel Prize in the year of. Uh, so these are my references. These are all the there is journals are available in that we can able to search about the mass spec and all. So I am very much thankful to the, uh, the Vice Chancellor, Dr. PVCD, Prasad Reddy, and all the uh, organizers. And uh, now I want to uh, questions. Madam? Yes, sir. Any questions from the audience? It is mute on that. One minute. Sir, any questions from the audience? Any any students? Students? No questions. Okay. In the in the absence of the questions, uh, sir, you have given an excellent lecture. You explained in detail about the mass spectroscopy, the principles of mass spectroscopy, the nitrogen rule, hydrogen rule, aromatic uh, uh, fragmentations, uh, how to identify the aromatic moieties. In detail and about uh, giving some of the examples, the fragmentation rule, its isotopes, and M plus one and then plus two. The, there are some sodium ions also, some in yeah, the fragmentation <laughs> that I think so. We, we yeah. followed all this. Yeah, that's Anyhow, so it's a very good lecture. It is useful for the students. I got feedback from the students also, sir. The yeah. lecture is very informative and it's very good. Thank you very much for giving a very excellent lecture. Yeah. Indeed, your voice is so clear. Your presentation is very, very good. That we thank, you very much. thank you for giving an opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, before ending this session, uh, my student Achitwali is going to give a vote of thanks of the oh. webinar. Okay, thank fine. You. I, will there. I will be there. I will be there. Okay, sir. Good afternoon, everyone, to the one and all present here. Honorable speakers, Professor M.K. Kajiravan, Professor and HOD in the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, SRM College of Pharmacy, Chennai and Professor B.M. Gurupadaya, JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research, respected the Girija Sastri, convener of this two days webinar, and all the participants from different institutes and industries. On behalf of the Pharmaceutical Chemistry Department, Andhra University College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, I would like to express my gratitude to all esteemed delegates of the webinar for their presence and contribution to, the, to make this webinar a great success. I extend my gratitude to our today's speaker, Professor M.K. Kathiravan and Professor B.M. Gurupadaya to take out time from their busy schedule to raise the event. Thank you for inspiring and encouraging us with your thought-provoking talks on this special day. A special thanks to organizing committee and Professor G. Girija Shankar, in charge principal of AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, for providing immense support to make the webinar successful. I extend my gratitude to Professor V. Girija Sastri, Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry, to organize the webinar and working hard for the past few days to make this webinar successful. I congratulate all the participants for their active participation and also technical staff for being with us for these two days and supporting us. Thank you, everyone, once again for making it a great success. Thank you. How many participants are there actually present online and offline mode? Um, 85. Sir, around 150 members have joined into the webinar, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Inviting and giving an opportunity for me. Thank you very much.
thank you sir we'll end up then now okay thank you madam thank you thank you all thank for listening and giving in i'll talk to you my phone soon okay thank you madam thank you okay. 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 Okay.